Star Wars The Clone Wars does not hold up. Yeah, all right, yeah, I, I know, I know. I Okay, oh, okay. Are, the, are the tomatoes really necessary? This is a new shirt. Now, for those of you who came here to tear me a new one after reading that title and thumbnail, let me explain exactly what I mean when I say doesn't hold up. While I have come to the conclusion that this show is overall bad, I also think that there's a lot of good stuff to be found here that's worth appreciating. But the thing is, The Clone Wars is a show that's beloved by many, myself included, and with that, you'll tend to find that it has something of an outspoken fan base. People are very passionate about this show, and I get why. I really do. The goal here isn't to tear down anyone's sacred cow or to tell you that you're wrong for liking the show. More than anything, I'm just here to do what I always do, give a fair and reasoned assessment of a thing with the best research and information that I possibly can. And in that spirit, I want to make it clear that when I'm determining if this show holds up, I'm looking at whether or not it achieves one of three things. Number one, is it as good as I remembered it to be? I watched the movie in theaters, and have been a fan of the show since day one, and over the years there are plenty of arcs that I've revisited and consider to be some of the best storytelling that Star Wars has to offer. So I want to take a look at some of those to determine whether or not they really were as good as I thought. And since I've already given away what my conclusion was, I might as well say that most of the stories I've considered exceptional for all these years are actually pretty poorly crafted under a more critical eye. That isn't to say that all of them are, there are a fair few amount that hold up pretty well, and there are some arcs that I previously never paid any mind to that, upon looking at them more critically, are actually a lot better than I remembered. But for the majority of these episodes, I found that they're either extremely rushed and leave a lot to be desired in terms of execution of great concepts, or they're actually just structurally abysmal from a writing standpoint. As I start getting into some examples later on, you're going to see what I mean, but that's essentially the gist of it. The second metric was to determine whether it's as good as everyone says it is, which is something I didn't need a rewatch to figure out. I already never considered it as good as the populace would have you believe even when I myself considered it great. Yes, pretty much anyone who's seen this show and they're likely to tell you that it's the best thing since the OT, which was the best thing since Jesus. And I don't think anything in Star Wars has ever lived up to the OT except for Andor, so... Yeah, it definitely doesn't hold up there. Which brings us to the third and final criteria this show needed to meet, and it's yet another thing that I already kind of considered impossible from the get-go. You see, one of the things that fans of this show like to say is that it fixed the prequel trilogy by retroactively adding character development to side characters, or for adding bits to the world building that were never seen or hardly developed in the films. The general idea being that the show did a great job filling in the gap between episodes 2 and 3 and made the prequels as a whole better for it. Now, if we're talking about the films themselves, then that simply isn't possible. It wouldn't matter if every episode of this show was 100% perfect from start to finish, the films should be made to stand on their own without relying on external media as a crutch. And I would definitely say that the prequels are sorely lacking in a lot of areas that can never be fixed, because they've already been made. They're out there now. They're part of the canon of this story, for better or for worse. But if you're looking at it more from a standpoint that it fixed the prequel era, then I'm absolutely fine with that. And that's more so what I aim to look for when determining if this show holds up to metric 3. Because ideally, a show set during the prequels should make that era better simply by nature of its being. It has the chance to expand the lore in ways that the prequels never really did, and it can also give us more insight to the relationship between Anakin and Obi-Wan, which is something that was pretty lacking in those movies. One of the biggest complaints about Revenge of the Sith is that the friendship between Anakin and Obi-Wan is always more implied rather than actually shown. We never see any of these bond-building missions they go on, all the precarious situations that Anakin has apparently rescued Obi-Wan from. I haven't felt you this tense since, since we fell into that nest of gun dogs. You fell into that nightmare, Master, and I rescued you, remember? Oh, yes. <laughs> Instead, they spend all three movies apart from each other for most of the runtime. You want to know what that business on Kaden Amoidi was that Obi-Wan says doesn't, doesn't count? Well, too bad. Go read a book. Listen, I'm all for there being external media for us to follow these characters around on their adventures without seeing them on the big screen, and I love Labyrinth of Evil. I'm just saying that I would have liked to see a little more in the actual films themselves to better justify Obi-Wan reminiscing so fondly about his friendship with Anakin in A New Hope. He was the best star pilot in the galaxy and a cunning warrior. 
was a good friend. Liar! Because here, they don't even really seem to like each other all that much, and when Anakin's not acting like a homicidal maniac or disrespecting Obi-Wan at every turn, he's just generally being an irritable little shit. Which is usually where someone would say that the Clone Wars comes along and fixes the problem. And yeah, I'll definitely give credit where credit is due, because the friendship between Anakin and Obi-Wan is fine here. I have my own notes about some of the execution and what I might have done differently that we'll get into later, but as it stands, I buy Obi-Wan's lines in episode 4 a lot better now than I did before watching the show. They actually feel like friends, even if what we get between them is mostly surface level banter. However, there are a lot of aspects to the world building and overall development of this universe introduced in the Clone Wars that not only don't do much to enrich the world of the prequels and Star Wars as a whole, but actively damage it in a lot of ways. For every Anakin and Obi-Wan have a decent friendship, there's the introduction of something so unbelievably world-breaking that it kind of undermines any effort that this show might have put forward to try to play damage control. And now that I've laid all that out, there are a few ground rules that I want to establish before we go any further. As many of you might already know, I made a video a while back about Dave Filoni and many of the choices that were made in this series in regards to the EU that was the extended canon at the time, as well as the decisions continually being made in his works that step all over the current Disney canon. Let's just say I didn't have very many nice things to say. And as many have been quick to point out, Dave Filoni was not the only creative decision maker on the show as it was being made, and in fact George Lucas was involved to varying degrees depending on who you ask. Some will say that old George was the end-all be-all when it came to creating the show and that Dave was basically just the guy who brought those ideas to life. This is because some of the things that I criticized in that video were apparently George's decision, like changing changing the name of Korriban to Moraband, or making Jango Fett not a Mandalorian. But having watched the featurettes and several interviews of the cast and crew of this show in preparation for this video, the best I can tell regarding George's involvement was that he gave some ideas here and there and mandated certain things that had to happen, including the two examples I just gave. Which, as you know, are decisions that I'm not the biggest fan of, but alas. But he's also the one who came up with the idea to give Anakin a Padawan and to resurrect Darth Maul. That's an interesting twist and it's only something that George could make happen. You know, he's sitting in the writer's room saying, we're going to do this, and all of us saying, mm, that's going to be a challenge because you cut him in half. <laughs> you know? The people commenting that are ultimately ignoring what was actually the point of that video anyway, which is that among most of the shows where canon-breaking contradictions are introduced, Filoni seems to be the one common denominator. Lucas is in no way involved with shows like The Bad Batch, Tales of the Jedi, or The Book of Boba Fett, and yet they each have moments that don't adhere to previously established book canon. The point of that video was to highlight that the same things that were done to the EU are now being done to the new canon, with one person who seems to always be at the scene of the crime. Now, the overall continuity of Star Wars under Disney is beyond broken at this point, so I really don't think there's a point in caring anymore, but the facts are the facts, regardless of how any of us personally feel about them. Thinking along those same lines, when I lay out the criticisms I have for this show, there might be a few times where I blame Filoni for what might very well not have been his fault, because I'm going for simplicity here and don't care to single out every individual writer who made a bad episode. I feel it's only fair that the the guy in charge should be willing to accept responsibility for any of the missteps in this series, regardless of if they were specifically his idea. And let's get that clear, he was the guy in charge. From what I've gathered in the featurettes and subsequent interviews, George was little more than an idea man who pitched them certain concepts that needed to be in the show, or mandated things like having Jar Jar be the focal point of some episodes. Why he decided to do that, I'll never know, but he did. <laughs> The only other creative choices made by Lucas were in the form of approving or shutting down ideas from his underlings depending on what he felt was best for Star Wars. But otherwise, Filoni had pretty much free reign to do whatever he wanted. In fact, did you know that Lucas originally wanted Ahsoka to die by the end of the show? He wanted her out of the picture by the time of Revenge of the Sith for obvious reasons, and it was Filoni's attachment to his precious OC that caused him to find a loophole that would allow her to survive past the prequels, and well past the point of overstaying her welcome. She should have died on Malachor. So I'm fully happy to believe that even with George as the big man on campus, Filoni was more than willing to take creative liberties and subvert Lucas's wishes. But also, it's worth saying this just to really make certain that I lose all credibility before we even begin. Even if George Lucas was the the main ideas guy behind most of the bad decisions in this show, 
I, I don't really see how that matters. Like, okay, so then it's George's fault. They're still bad ideas. I, I don't see what's changed. See, people have this really odd perception that George is some kind of, like, Star Wars messiah and that whatever he says must be gospel, but I'm not really about that shit. I'm not gonna sit here and pretend that the guy responsible for these films can never have a bad idea. Also, speaking of the EU, the other ground rule that I wanted to establish is that I'm gonna try my best not to talk about the countless contradictions this show creates with what was the established canon at the time. Because that's what the Dave Filoni video was about, and there's no reason to repeat myself. We're here to assess the show's overall quality purely from the standpoint of how it works in tandem with itself and the films, and so for the most part, I'm gonna treat this show as an adaptation of the source material, as opposed to something that was meant to share continuity with it. I mean, that's basically how the writers of the show treated it. When we started reading the EU stuff about you know, how she was raised, it was extremely tragic. And we wanted to, you know, kind of explore that further because that really drives her character to the point that it is now in these episodes as a bounty hunter. Now, there will be times where I simply can't help myself, like, for example, the way characters like Quinlan Voss and Aura Singh are handled. But for the most part, I really am going to try to just pretend that the EU isn't a factor and assess the show as it is. And lastly, I already know a lot of you guys are going to deflect most of these criticisms by saying that the show is made for kids, which is a whole other can of worms that frankly deserves its own video. And honestly, fans can even seem to agree on whether or not this is a kid's show. Some will cite the various suicides, genocides, decapitations, mass slavery, plagues, and other dark concepts and tell you that that proves this show was meant for a more mature audience. And others will say that the people behind it intended for it to be targeted toward children and so it must be so. I don't really care either way which side you fall on. Whether or not this show is for kids, I will never be of the belief that kids shows can't also have great writing. And I frankly find myself insulted on behalf of children everywhere whenever I hear people argue otherwise. I'm not looking for the next Martin Scorsese masterpiece here. A show with a consistent plot, world building, characterization, and good themes is all you really need. And I don't want to hear a single one of you argue that that's out of the realm of possibility just because it's written for 10 year olds. You got me? So now that that's all finally out of the way, let's begin. One of the things I've always liked about this show is that there is no clear main character, and so we're able to kind of jump around to various different characters and follow their story without tying it back to one singular protagonist. Something which I'd say Rebels struggled with at times. But if I had to narrow it down and pick a main character for this show, it'd probably be Anakin or Ahsoka. And since Ahsoka is literally absent for an entire season aside from one Force vision, I'd give it to Anakin simply by default. Which makes sense, of course. This is a show set during the prequel era of which Anakin was the central protagonist. So I guess I'll be starting off this video with a hot take here because I know a lot of people like Anakin in this show and I get why, but I don't think he's very well characterized and that's largely due to two things. The first being that he's basically a different character entirely from his film counterpart. Where in the movies he's a whiny, bratty sociopath who throws tantrums and slaughters innocents. In the show he's much more noble and charismatic and all around just a better person. Which sounds great, but these two versions are inconsistent with one another despite supposedly being in the same continuity. And again, we're judging the show from a standpoint of how well it keeps in continuity with itself and the films. So whether you like it or not, this major inconsistency with Anakin's character is a problem. I know a lot of people probably like this version of Anakin a lot more than the movie version, and hey, I'd probably even say I agree with you. But I'm a big believer in taking the bad with the good and doing your best to try to make it work when dealing with with another person's previously established IP, rather than simply ignoring the parts that are inconvenient and reworking it to fit your liking, and then trying to pass these two off as the same character, because they're just not. My second major issue with Anakin is simply that he's a mostly static character throughout the majority of the show who basically gets zero development between the time he first appears and when we last see him, and I think that is one massive misstep, because the time between episode 2 and episode 3 should arguably have been when 
when Anakin received the most development. In the prequels, it's made pretty explicit that the Jedi don't trust Anakin, even with tasks that are extremely simple and basic. No more than four weeks ago were they hesitant to give him his first assignment away from Obi-Wan, even though the details of said assignment were literally just to protect a senator who already had her own security team and was planning to stay in the safe and remote lake country of her home planet. Her life was definitely in danger, but she had an overabundance of security, and Anakin's presence really wasn't necessary beyond critical redundancy. But now he's a general in the Grand Army of the Republic and is being assigned a Padawan to train? His premature promotion to knighthood I get. It speaks to the necessity of creating more generals for this war effort, conveying just how short-staffed and desperate the Jedi really are. It gives us a clear idea that the Jedi are in over their heads and are willing to let an inexperienced child command soldiers. But giving him a Padawan... Really. And again, I know this was George's idea, but that doesn't mean I agree with it, and I really wish someone had talked some sense into this man. Because the reason given by Yoda for why the Jedi assigned Ahsoka to Anakin is that they're worried about Anakin's strong attachments and are hoping that training a student will help him overcome that. But in the films, you don't really get the impression that they even notice it. They're much more focused on the war, if anything, to the point where they don't even pick up on the fact that he's married to a prominent senator that he's been obsessed with for over a decade despite it being really obvious. Now suddenly they're taking a vested interest in making sure Anakin's troubles are sufficiently dealt with, which seems to stand in stark opposition to the way he was feeling in Revenge of the Sith about the Jedi. There you got the impression that he's not very well understood by anyone else in the Order, and I mean, how could he be having had such a different upbringing, which has informed his feelings of aloofness and his isolation from them. He no longer confides in any of them, not even his own master, because they all treat him like some alien to be studied. One of the reasons why Palpatine's manipulations on Anakin were so effective was because he actually took the time to level with him and treat him like a person. He became one of the only people that Anakin felt he could truly trust, and that was thanks in large part to the fact that the Jedi didn't know what to do with him. Only Qui-Gon would have, and we all know what happened to him. The end result being that Anakin is sort of a maverick who marches to the beat of his own drum, but hardly commands the respect of his peers or superiors. I don't get that impression here, though, because because they not only entrust him with a Padawan, but he's handed multiple important assignments throughout the series, seemingly respected by other knights and masters, and even Mace Windu treats him more as an equal and as a comrade. Whenever these two are together in the show, I never really get the sense that Windu mistrusts Anakin or sees him as arrogant or undisciplined or any of the other traits that Mace very clearly sees in Anakin in the movies. And I find that really weird because Windu was essentially the physical embodiment of everything wrong with the Jedi of his era, and his dogmatic and narrow-minded stubbornness was one of the reasons he made such a great foil for Anakin. I don't get the sense that this version of Anakin would ever kill this version of Mace if it meant saving Palpatine after Palpatine was revealed as a Sith Lord. Because again, Anakin is way too stable and put together in this series for me to believe he would ever turn into this in just a few short years. To be fair, this show does develop Anakin's growing mistrust toward the Order in the Season 4 arc where they fake Obi-Wan's death and leave Anakin in the dark about it, as well as the Season 5 arc where they expel Ahsoka from the Order without a fair trial. I'm just saying that they already had those seeds planted as early as pre-Attack of the Clones, so if we're going to remain consistent with the films, I think we should have been seeing that from the get-go, not just toward the tail end of the show. If anything, you know what would have been a really interesting thing to play off of that the films don't take enough advantage of? Shmi Skywalker. The mother of Anakin Skywalker, whose death will become the catalyst for his motivations to save Padme from the same fate, and ultimately doom him into becoming Darth Vader, and she's barely even mentioned in this entire show. A golden opportunity for this show to fix the prequels, and she's only mentioned four times throughout the entire series. Again, I really don't think that the films did enough to explore his relationship with her, and I certainly don't think she was used as effective as she could have been to better inform his motivations going into episode 3. Yes, her death was the reason Anakin was certain that his nightmares about Padme dying in childbirth were true, but beyond that, she isn't leveraged nearly enough. And that's kind of a shame, because despite everything we've just gone over, Anakin's
Anakin's motivation to turn on the Jedi and slaughter the entire Order is barely fleshed out. But they had all the pieces they needed right in front of them in the form of Shmi Skywalker. Remember, in Attack of the Clones, Anakin was having nightmares about her death as early as a month before the movie even began, and it's said that they're getting worse and worse. It's also heavily implied that he's begged Obi-Wan to let him go save her, but every plea has been refused, probably in the hopes that Anakin will learn to forego those pesky attachments of his. I don't know why I keep dreaming about him. Dreams pass in time. And then after his worst nightmare yet, Anakin finally goes to Tatooine to find his mother because he's no longer under Obi-Wan's thumb. He's finally been given his first assignment away from his master, which allows him to slip away despite his duties to protect Padme. Only so that when he finally finds her, he learns that she's been captured by the Tusken Raiders and spent the better part of a month being tortured by them, and she dies in his arms before even getting to finish the phrase. This is ripe for potential, and I really don't understand why the films never played off of this. Anakin has a few dark moments following this, obviously. There's the slaughtering of the Tuscans, the scene where he rants to Padme and confesses his massacre, and the scene where he buries his mother and promises that, while he wasn't strong enough to save her, he won't fail again. And two out of three of these scenes are actually really good, but then for the rest of the movie, he's as cavalier as can be. He's joking around with Padme, quipping with Obi-Wan, and there's never a scene at any point in this movie or the next where he ever confronts Obi-Wan about his mom, or blames him, or blames the Jedi. Not one conversation. Yoda even senses that Anakin specifically is in terrible pain during the same sequence where he kills the Tuscans, and neither he nor Obi-Wan ever brings this up to Anakin. Or if they do, we never see it. Realistically, Anakin should blame them. If they'd let him go even a week earlier, Shmi probably would have survived with some injury. Or actually, I'll do you one better. Had the Jedi taken the time to free his mother from slavery right after the Phantom Menace, she would have been safely away from Tatooine and never would have been captured by the Sand People to begin with. As far as he should be concerned, it's all their fault that his mother is dead, and specifically he should be angry with Obi-Wan. Because ultimately, it was his choice not to let Anakin go, counselor or no counsel. And you know, one of the many improvements to Revenge of the Sith that can be found in the film's subsequent novelization is that Anakin's motivations are much better fleshed out in that book. You know that scene where he's denied the rank of master and throws a temper tantrum and it's been memed to death because Sam Jackson tells him to take a seat? Well, that scene is made significantly significantly better by the novelization, because you actually have a clear understanding of why Anakin is getting angry, beyond just some vague ego. In the book, we learn that Anakin at this point no longer cares all that much about being a Jedi. He doesn't particularly like them, and they obviously don't like him. He'd have probably left a long time ago were it not for the fact that there's a war on and he's one of the best generals the Republic have. Still though, he has no intention of staying with the Order forever, and in fact assumes that he'll be ousted one way or another when the Jedi inevitably inevitably piece together that Padme's child is his. But when Anakin has his first nightmare about Padme, and he knows to listen to them thanks to his mother, he knows he needs to find a way to save her, and he thinks that there are secrets hidden away in the Jedi archives that are only accessible to masters. Secrets that'll help him become powerful enough to stop her from dying. So when the Jedi deny him the rank that would gain him access to this knowledge, he's rightfully pissed. It comes down to something as simple as, the Jedi stopped me from saving my mother, I will not let them stop me from saving Padme. And right there you have all the motivation you need. Anakin's done, he's fed up with the Jedi, he's long since stopped caring what they think of him, and he just wants to save his wife and spend the rest of his life with her and the baby, as far away from the Republic and the Order as possible. And they won't even allow him that. In comes Palpatine with a potential solution and an offer to destroy the Jedi, and suddenly the pieces start to fit together much more naturally. I still don't think this is enough for him to kill kids though. If I were George, I would have just probably scrapped this scene entirely, because if anything, these kids should represent to Anakin the very same innocence that he once had before being indoctrinated by the Jedi. He should want to save them. But then again, he already killed Tusken kids back in episode 2, so what 
do I know? Child murder is funny. <laughs> Again, all of this should have been made a lot more explicit in the films themselves, but the facts are that they weren't. So if we're opting to fix the prequel era, then we're probably going to want to have some mention of this in the show. Even if it's something simple, like a conversation between Anakin and Obi-Wan, or a confrontation from Yoda. I think there should have been some lingering, unspoken tension between Obi-Wan and Anakin for at least the first handful of episodes, until eventually everything just kind of bubbles to the surface in an explosive and emotional scene. But even after that scene, where Anakin lays it all out for Obi-Wan, I'd want to keep that going indefinitely. Eventually, we can have it to where Anakin forgives him and they have some sort of heart-to-heart, -heart, but I would never fully let that tension between them die. For the rest of the show, it would be right there just underneath the surface, picking away at both of them as the war carries on and they continue to grow further apart. And this would all be helped in large part by starting the series off with Anakin as a Padawan and getting rid of Ahsoka as his student. I'm not saying her character needs to be deleted entirely. The show could still be about her just as much as about them. I just don't think giving Anakin a Padawan was ever a good idea to begin with. And I think the show would work much better if Anakin didn't immediately start off as a Jedi Knight with everything already figured out. Again, I'm looking for some development for these characters, so having Anakin become better over the course of the war would be a much more natural story set between these two films than simply having him be in one place the entire time. Over the seasons, Anakin's physical appearance could change alongside his spiritual growth as we see him undertake more and more trials that test him. Maybe we can even get an arc where Anakin faces the Jedi trials and becomes a knight sometime in one of the later seasons. If you want to build an older brother, younger sister relationship between Anakin and Ahsoka, you can still do that. He's 19 and she's 14, so even if he's still a Padawan, it would only be natural for him to take her under his wing and become something of a mentor to her, aside from whoever her actual Jedi Master would be. But of course, this is all dealing in hypotheticals, and as fun as it is to think about what could have been, right now it's my job to take a look at what this show actually does with these characters. Along the same lines as what I was just talking about, you know what's another major missed opportunity that the prequels missed out on by not exploring it as in-depth as they probably should have? Slavery. It's, you know, kind of a big thing that has a bit of a mild adverse effect on the people involved, and I don't think the movies did a great job of portraying just how horrible it is to be a slave. Any attempt to escape, and they blow you up. Boom! I would imagine something like that would define a good chunk of Anakin's view of the world and the unfair systems at play that allowed him to ever be in that situation to begin with, but... Nope. Uh-uh. In The Phantom Menace, we meet Anakin at nine years old, which already feels like a mistake. He definitely should have been around 15 to 16 to really solidify the hardships of slavery into his outlook on life, because honestly, he doesn't seem all that bothered by it, really. He lives in a decent home with his mother, he's given a fair amount of freedom from Watto, and he can basically just do whatever he wants as long as he doesn't disobey his master and doesn't, you know, leave. I'm not saying it's a good situation, it's still slavery, but it's not nearly as hard harsh as I think the film should have made it out to be. I know it's meant to be for kids or whatever, so maybe George didn't want to make it too dark for fear of parents not wanting to take their children to see this movie, but if you're concerned about making your little space fantasy movie kid-friendly, maybe don't introduce a concept as heavy as slavery, and then use it as a motivator for your story's main character? If you're gonna introduce it, you should commit to showing that life as a slave is living hell day in and day out. Show the cruelty and desperation and absolute hopelessness that these poor people go through every single day. If I was in the writer's room for this movie and saw Anakin yell Yippee! after being given an order from his owner, I'd probably just quit on the spot. And the worst part is, after Anakin is freed and taken to be a Jedi, it's never really brought up again. Like, in Attack of the Clones, he's worried about his mother's safety because he's having nightmares about her, but when he returns to find her, she's no longer even a slave. Her death had absolutely nothing to do with it. And like I already touched on a bit ago, you'd think Anakin might harbor a little resentment toward the Jedi for never seeing to it that Shmi was set free and given a home somewhere away from Tatooine, where all she's ever known is pain pain and suffering. Like, The Phantom Menace does establish that because the Republic doesn't have jurisdiction as far out as Tatooine, they're not able to enforce their anti-slavery laws or get involved in it, nor with the Jedi by proxy. And that's definitely something that should piss Anakin off too, but we'll get back to that in just a second. But even though the Jedi and the Republic can't enforce a law that the Huts have to free their slaves, that doesn't mean they can't, like, 
buy Shmi or something. Like seriously, have Kiari Mundi walk into Wado's shop with a treasure chest full of gold doubloons and pay the man to set her free and then, I don't know, give her a patch of land somewhere and let her farm or something if you don't want Anakin near her because of attachments or whatever. Even if he's not allowed to see her, I think Anakin would be much happier just knowing she's free and safe. This guy's the fucking chosen one. You want to keep him happy. In the Clone Wars, we get an arc in season 4 that deals with slavery and I find it really interesting. In it, we follow Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka to the planet Zygeria, which used to be the home of a massive slave empire sometime in the ancient past, before the Jedi brought them down. They formed an alliance with Count Dooku to revitalize their empire to its glory days with a place on the Separatist Council, and in turn Dooku will ferry entire populations of Separatist-occupied planets their way to auction off to the highest bidder. One such population is the Togruta people of Kiros, who the Jedi have been tasked with finding, and so they have to infiltrate the Zygerian hub to find out where they're being held before it's too late. Now, props to the show first and foremost for actually depicting slavery as the harsh, never-ending cycle of despair and hopelessness that it is. I mean, we see Obi-Wan absolutely go through it in this arc, and from his perspective, we can see how grueling the life of a slave is. I have no notes on that particular aspect of these episodes other than to say good job. But I did want to talk about how this arc handles Anakin's reaction to the concept of slavery, which is to say he barely even had one, really. A lot of people like to share around this clip of Anakin getting really angry at the slaver and then Obi-Wan has to explain his backstory to Ahsoka so that she can understand why this mission is so personal to him. And that is a pretty cool scene, but the problem is that's basically all we get. For the rest of the arc, he's perfectly cool and level-headed, and he's as charismatic and quippy as is typical for his character in this show. We only get this moment and a few other random bursts of anger to remind us that Anakin did indeed used to be a slave, and he is not happy with these evil cat people. And for pretty much any other episode, I'm perfectly happy for Anakin to be in a jokey, cavalier mood. But this is the one arc where I think he should have been all business the entire time. With something as important and personal as slavery being brought into the equation, I don't want to hear a single joke out of him for the entire arc. He should have been laser focused on getting the job done by any means necessary to the point where Obi-Wan, Ahsoka, and Rex were worried about him. And even as a kid, it never exactly sat right with me that the Zygerian Queen died in Anakin's arms and it was, for whatever reason known only to God, treated as a sad moment? Like, is she supposed to be a sympathetic character? This woman who's the queen of a centuries-old slave empire, who's auctioned off entire civilizations of people, and who currently has Obi-Wan working tirelessly in the slave mines? We haven't learned anything about her that should make us feel sad that she's dying, and Anakin absolutely should not be having this reaction. He's a former slave! She's the queen of a slave empire, and she's currently holding him, Obi-Wan, Ahsoka, and Rex as slaves, which is bad enough on its own without the trauma that should be boiling to the surface right now for Anakin. He should fucking hate her. He should be glad she's dying. Or if not, then you're gonna need to build some kind of relationship between these two characters that, I'm sorry, just is not there. They spend the entirety of their time together flirting with each other for some reason? Like, he's her slave, sure, but I guess he's into that shit, I don't know. No judgments here, I guess, to each their own, but I guess Anakin just forgot about his wife and abandoned whatever stance he might previously have held about this extremely personal atrocity because he was horny and now he's sad that his cat waifu is dead? I don't know, this is a weird scene and I never liked it. Also, remember a minute ago when I said that Anakin should be more pissed about the fact that the Jedi and the Republic don't do anything about slavery and regions that are outside of their borders? Well, imagine if we'd gotten to see Anakin's perspective on being sent on this mission. He probably spent years pioneering for them to take a stronger stance against slavery in the Outer Rim, only for the Jedi to deny his requests every time. But now, when the Separatists are involved and they have something to gain by helping the slaves, now the Republic choose to get involved? If you were Anakin, wouldn't that fucking piss you off? Wouldn't you be thinking yet again about your mother, who could have been saved if only she wasn't left on Tatooine by the Jedi and the bureaucrats puppeteering them? Maybe this could be yet another arc that deepens his resentment toward the Order and better informs his motivations in wanting to kill them. And Anakin was already of the belief that the Republic 
public is corrupt and bogged down by red tape, always disregarding the little guy and instead choosing to focus on the bigger picture. And this arc could have taken that belief and amped it up to 11. This should anger him. But these episodes never once bring any of this up, and I find that extremely frustrating. This is just one of many arcs that should have been pivotal to Anakin's development, but instead it's a pretty generic story about fighting the Separatists and winning the day, and then we move on to the next arc where it'll never be brought up again. There's gonna be more to say about this arc in a later section, but for now, let's take a look at a few more examples. So, one of the main characteristics that you can apply to Anakin from the films is his attachment to others. It's the entire reason he ends up turning to the dark side in light of his visions about Padme. And we've been shown how fear of loss can lead to the dark side if not properly dealt with, which the Jedi failed to do with Anakin. This leaves him clinging to anyone at all who might actually care for him, and as such, he finds friends and family in even the most peculiar places that most people would overlook. In things like droids, for instance. The Clone Wars deals with Anakin's attachment to others in multiple arcs to varying degrees of success. Sometimes, in the case of the Clovis arcs, where we deal with Anakin's possessive and toxic relationship with Padme, it's done pretty well. However, sometimes it's not. One of the most frustrating arcs in this series that I always hated even when I was a kid is the two episodes in season one called Downfall of a Droid and Duel of the Droids. In these episodes, we watch Anakin take serious damage to his Jedi Starfighter during a battle, and in the process, he loses R2, only finding out about this loss after waking up in the medical bay. Ah! He then insists to Obi-Wan that he needs to send a team out there to find him, but of course, Obi-Wan is dealing more in practicalities, and he doesn't see much use in spending time and resources searching for one astromech. Anakin is obviously not happy to hear that due to his unwillingness to let go of others, even something as seemingly insignificant as a droid. Our two units are a dime a dozen. I'm sure you'll find a suitable replacement. However, Anakin is able to get Obi-Wan to concede after revealing that he never wiped R2's memory banks, which he was apparently supposed to do after every mission, which means that R2 is now holding top secret information that can't be allowed to fall into the hands of the Separatists. And as it so happens, that's exactly what Grievous was hoping for as he sent a scavenger ship out to collect the remains of the droid and bring him back to Grievous on Ruson. So now the race is on to recover R2 for purely strategic reasons, of course. Along the way, Anakin is presented with a replacement droid in the form of R3-S6, as it's standard protocol for Jedi to have astromechs along with them in their fighters. Obviously, Anakin's not having any of it because he's still set on getting R2 back, and so now we have our inner conflict brought to the forefront. Anakin isn't shy about his distaste for this new droid, even nicknaming him Stubby, and we learn from Ahsoka that R3 is a better model than R2, which makes enough sense considering his name would imply he's from a later series, and would therefore be more technically impressive, but it just doesn't matter. Anakin wouldn't care if R3 was the best droid ever built because he's not R2. But where I think these episodes take a turn for the worst is the way that R3 is actually handled in relation to Anakin. You see, throughout the next couple of episodes, he keeps accidentally messing up in ways that almost get our main characters killed at several points, which causes Anakin to question whether or not R3 is defective. We find out by the end that the real reason this is actually happening is that R3 is secretly a plant work for Grievous, who's been intentionally sabotaging Anakin at every turn. Traitor! I hate this twist so much. I think by making R3 a traitor, the writers really shot themselves in the foot with the message they were trying to get across, because now all the hate Anakin threw R3's way was completely justified. And honestly, even if he wasn't a traitor, they still mishandled him by having him constantly screw up, because again, Anakin has every rational reason at that point to dislike him. I think if you wanted to get the idea across effectively, he should have just been a good droid. Just a completely competent and loyal robot. If anything, R3 should actually have been better than R2, like Ahsoka said his model was. Maybe he has better motor functions, faster brain power, more of whatever these things are. If they'd written it this way so that all logic would dictate that R3 is a better droid than R2, then all Anakin's left with to rationalize why he hates him is that he simply isn't R2, and then that can be an aspect of his character for him to reflect on. Instead, they go and rescue R2, R3 reveals himself as a traitor, and then, I kid you not, <laughs> the two droids have a fucking duel in a collapsing Separatist listening station, and it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my entire life.
Then R3 gets fucked, the heroes get away, and it's never developed any further. They vaguely allude to it in the last scene of the episode, but it's little more than a disappointed head shake from Obi-Wan. Even though during the mission, Anakin went off to go find R2, leaving Ahsoka and the clones to complete their end, and Ahsoka ended up having to face off against General fucking Grievous all by herself. Anakin's attachment and unwillingness to let go of R2 forced a barely trained Ahsoka to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of the most skilled swordsmen in the entire galaxy. Allegedly. And this is never addressed by any of the characters, nor does Anakin ever stop to think about the fact that she could have been killed. Like, guys, are we really not gonna talk about this? And listen, this isn't to say that I think Anakin's unhealthy attachments to the ones he loves isn't ever handled well. I already said I think the Clovis arcs are great for that very reason, because because they showcase his jealousy in a way that I would actually believe he'd act. If anything, the biggest problem I have with those episodes is that he's characterized inconsistently with how he's handled for the majority of this show. But again, that's only really because this show characterizes him inconsistently with his film counterpart, so I'd hesitate to even call that a problem. But yeah, Anakin isn't a particularly great husband in these episodes, and honestly, Padme's not exactly the best wife either. Which makes perfect sense because they were kids when they met, and they were still kids when they got together. Together, Anakin especially so. And they got married really fast, too. This is, like, right after Geonosis. He proposed?! It's been five days! So I think it's great that these episodes actually develop the toxicity in their relationship, where most of the time, Padme is either a glorified side character, or she and Anakin are just generic husband and generic wife who do the smooch sometimes. They rush into a marriage at an extremely young age without really knowing the slightest thing about each other, and we've seen how Anakin feels at the prospect of romantic rivals from Padme's past. Very cute. Dark curly hair. Dreamy eyes. All right, I get the picture. People have told me they don't like the scene where Anakin beats up Clovis, and I think the reason why is because the jealousy he feels that turns into rage and causes him to lash out is the most consistent that this version of Anakin has ever gotten to how he was depicted in the films, and I for one am all for it. I also really like that Clovis isn't just some generic bad guy like almost every other villain in this show is, as we're gonna get into later. He doesn't particularly like Anakin, and yet he lies for him when Padme sick Security asks him what happened after Anakin kicked the living shit out of him. Everything he does may be bad, but it's always what he sees to be in the best interest of the people he cares about. In a way, he and Anakin are a lot more similar than either of them would ever admit, striking deals with devils to achieve what they consider to be the greater good that will ensure the safety of their loved ones. He's a great reflection of Anakin, and I would honestly tout the Clovis arcs as some of the best on the show, were it not for other factors that we'll get into much later. My biggest complaint here is that the there aren't enough episodes that deal with Anakin and Padme's relationship. The two arcs with Clovis are separated by four seasons, with one taking place in season two and the other in season six. And I can't think of a single other episode between these two that develops this marriage at all. For the rest of the show, this relationship, which, need I remind you, is meant to be the catalyst for the birth of Darth Vader, isn't fleshed out, and by extension, Padme isn't really well fleshed out either. For the most part, the best they do with Padme is introduce political concepts that show the more nuanced and logistical side of the war, which is absolutely welcome. But they don't do much for her character, and like I already said, there are very few of those episodes that I would consider good or great, and a whole plethora of political episodes that are just straight up awful. All in good time, though, that's getting its own category. For now, let's get back to Anakin. I would say for the most part when dealing with Anakin's attachment issues, you'll get something that's neither good nor bad, but somewhere right in the middle. If it's not a confused and muddled concept, concept in an episode that doesn't seem to know what lesson it's trying to convey, then it's typically a brief glimpse of Anakin's darker aspects that hint to a much deeper flaw beneath the surface, but it never really goes much further than that. I'm referring mainly to those scenes that everyone likes to post about, like the one where he resorts to torturing Poggle for information that will save Ahsoka, or when he chokes out the bartender on Nalhutta for information regarding Obi-Wan's supposed assassin. These are brief moments that are few and far between, but they hint at a darker aspect of the character 
character that will eventually be better informed by Revenge of the Sith, theoretically. But the issue with these little moments is that they're basically inconsequential. I mentioned already how Ahsoka ended up having to face off against Grievous by herself so that Anakin could go after R2, and how that's just never really addressed. And there are similar moments throughout the show where Anakin's detrimental flaws just don't really affect the plot in any significant way. Take for example the three-part arc that opened up Season 2, which is about Cad Bane breaking into the Jedi Temple to steal a holocron that contains a list of all four sensitive children on Jedi record so that Sidious can get to them first. In the second episode of the arc, Bane manages to lure Ahsoka into a trap so that when Anakin finally catches up to them, he's forced to choose between saving Ahsoka's life or maintaining the secret contents of the holocron. Bane needs a Jedi to open it, and so he forces him into a situation where if he refuses to comply, Ahsoka will be shot out of an airlock into space. And of course, it's no real contest. Anakin chooses to save Ahsoka, but as a result, Bane gets away with access to the names of every Force-sensitive child that the Jedi know about. However, aside from the plot of the episode that immediately follows this one, this is something that never impacts the story or the characters ever again. In part three, Bane kidnaps a few children and takes them to Mustafar, but then Anakin and Ahsoka figure out where they are, they rescue them before Sidious's nefarious deeds can be carried out, and the children are returned back to their respective families. And at the end of the episode, the Jedi note that the holocron is back safely at the temple, and there are no signs that the list was copied. The list is intact and there is no evidence it was copied. At no point for the rest of the series do we ever see the results of Anakin's decision be brought back to the limelight. It could have been interesting if some of the Inquisitors we end up seeing in Rebels were children that Palpatine kidnapped thanks to having gained access to this list, and that would have been a direct result of Anakin's choice, but we're never given any indication in either show that that's the case. Once again, Anakin's attachment issues cause a conflict that have no lasting consequences beyond the arc in which it's set. There is a Rebels episode that I guess is supposed to be a spiritual sequel to this arc, but it takes place 16 years later, so none of the children that are being kidnapped by the Inquisitors in that episode would have been on the list that Anakin gave Bane access to, ah! so I really wouldn't count that. Now, potentially the most important part of Anakin's character that this show touches upon is the prophecy of the Chosen One, which was introduced in the prequels, not very well defined or developed, and if I'm being honest, never really made all that much sense to me, nor did it seem to play in into the larger narrative of the original six films. In The Phantom Menace, the prophecy of the Chosen One is introduced to us through a dialogue exchange between Qui-Gon and the Jedi Council, specifically Yoda and Mace Windu, who are basically the only two council members who ever actually talk. What we learn is very little. Basically, Qui-Gon considers it possible that Anakin was immaculately conceived by the midichlorians, given that Shmi told him he didn't have a father, and all Mace says about the prophecy is that this mythical Chosen One is meant to restore balance to to the Force, whatever that really means. Throughout the next two films, whenever anyone brings up the idea that Anakin really is the Chosen One, they never say much more than that. And that's what I mean when I say that the concept never really was all that well defined. I don't know what the Jedi mean by balance, nor am I sure that their definition of balance is even the correct one, if such a thing exists. And it's never really brought up even once in the OT, because I don't think George had thought of the concept yet when those movies were written. If such a prophecy is is true, and the films kind of leave it up in the air whether or not it really is, then I suppose we're meant to believe that somehow killing the Emperor is how he achieved this abstract goal of balance. And I mean, to be fair, Obi-Wan does specifically refer to destroying the Sith as the means in which balance can be restored. Is he not to destroy the Sith and bring balance to the Force? It was said that you would destroy the Sith, not join them! Bring balance to the Force! But again, that reads a lot more like Jedi bias than the actual objective definition of balance, whatever that may or may not be. Like, yeah, of course the Jedi would believe that this prophesied chosen one is meant to exterminate their ancient enemy who's been a constant thorn in their side for thousands of years, and in so doing, restore balance to the Force, but that doesn't mean that that's actually what balance means. The Jedi could just be wrong. And yes, right about now, some of you are probably just itching to give me George's explanation of the chosen one prophecy, and we'll get to that in just a moment, but I should clarify in case you're 
are new here that we don't accept external sources of information on this channel, even if it's from the big guy himself. I'm looking solely at what the films present here, and as far as I can tell, none of these movies define the parameters of this prophecy and what it means to bring balance to the Force. And here's the thing, I actually prefer that. I like the idea that the prophecy might not even be real, as many of the characters speculate to be the case. I think that's a lot more interesting than this Jedi kid is actually just destined to bring balance or something, and having that actually be confirmed by the text. Now, yes, there is the matter of Anakin having been born of no father, presumably via the Force, and that would put a damper on my interpretation, but I don't necessarily think that a miraculous birth, if one even took place, means definitively that that's the case. Now, all that being said, I do recognize that George obviously intended for Anakin to be the Chosen One, which is why I'm not definitively saying he's not, just that what that precisely means is never clearly defined in the films, and so I'd prefer to head canon that the prophecy is either bullshit or a prophecy that misread could have been. Either way, now let's take a look at how Mr. Lucas defines the prophecy, because it's going to be relevant here in a minute to how Dave Filoni and crew interpreted it. I mean, you got the dark side, the light side. One is selfless, one is selfish. And you want to keep them in balance. What happens when you go to the dark side is it goes out of balance and then you get really selfish and you forget about everybody and you ultimately lead yourself because when you get selfish you get stuff or you want stuff mm -hmm. and when you want stuff and you get stuff then you get are afraid somebody's going to take it away from you. He gives a pretty long-winded explanation that I'm not going to play in full because it can basically just be summed up in a few sentences for efficiency's sake. But of course the full video I've gotten this clip from will be linked down below so you guys can go check my sources. His reasons for why the dark side lead to imbalance essentially boil down to that it causes inherent selfishness and suffering. It causes the one who wields the dark side to become mired in their own desires and fears. The way I think this was meant to be interpreted and you can go ahead and correct me if I'm wrong, is that it's less of a cosmic imbalance between two sides of some supernatural deity, and more of a spiritual imbalance within all living beings who succumb to the dark side. It's more of an individual thing, but no less of an imbalance in the Force. And so, the very existence of the Sith invites imbalance, and must therefore be destroyed for the Chosen One prophecy to be fulfilled. That is the best interpretation I could deduce from the explanation provided, because frankly, even in these interviews that exist outside of the text in question, I don't think the terms of this prophecy are all that well defined. However, that's the explanation that makes the most sense and seems to be in line with how George describes it, and if we take it as true, that means that Anakin really did bring balance to the Force and fulfill his destiny in Episode 6. So now let's take a look at how Filoni interpreted this explanation. A lot of the notes from Mortis come from a really old binder that George has that has his original writings on what the Force is and what makes it up. The core of the force. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got the dark side, the light side. One is selfless, one is selfish. And you want to keep them in balance. Slowly over time. Oh. Uh Okay. The Mortis arc in Season 3 introduces us to a bunch of wacky concepts, like a Force realm that seems to be some sort of pocket dimension that exists outside of the galaxy, and on which beings sensitive to the Force are significantly more powerful than they typically are, which is proven with Anakin's ascension to basically godhood at one point in the first episode. We also meet these three creatures called the Ones, who are basically just Force gods, and they each embody the spiritual aspects of the Force. The daughter represents the light side of the Force, the sun, the dark, and the father represents the balance between the two sides, constantly keeping his children at bay so that the Force may remain in balance. Being that Anakin is the chosen one, the interpretation the story seems to give us for what exactly that means is that Anakin is meant to replace the father upon his death and keep his children at bay. What ultimately ends up happening instead is that all three of them die by the end, so there no longer seems to be any need for that. Uh I guess it's fine, then? There's a lot to break down with these episodes, and frankly, I don't even know where to begin. But I feel it's worth saying that these are often cited as some of, if not the best episodes on the entire show, and I sort of just always went along with that because I didn't fully understand what this arc was trying to tell me. I still don't know that I fully get it, which apparently was by design. We both firmly believe that we should really not answer directly a lot of the questions about Mortis. We have answers to those questions, for sure. But if I answer directly what something is, I feel that I'll be robbing you 
of the purpose of that arc, which is to make you wonder. It's to make you challenge certain ideas, to ask questions. Yeah, Dave, you can continue to use the excuse of ambiguity, but something tells me you just didn't really know what you wanted to do with the story here, which seems to be turning into a common theme. Regardless, let's try to figure this out. So... The big thing to take note of is the fact that this arc seems to be establishing that the actual correct interpretation of balance is the very literal definition. The light side and the dark side need to be absolutely equal in power for there to be balance in the force. I'm not really sure if I even know what that means exactly, and it doesn't sound like it's achievable. Like, does that mean that there needs to be an equal number of Jedi and Sith for there to be balance in the force? Because at no point did Anakin ever bring about that outcome, which would suggest that he's not really the chosen one. To be clear, I don't think that's what these episodes are trying to say, but the only other interpretation for this I can think of is that balance literally means Anakin has to sit here on Mortis for the rest of ever and make sure these two Force gods stay in their lane, which doesn't really seem to work either. That would seem to imply that by killing all three of them by the end, he already fulfilled his destiny and the entire rest of his life is just him doing shit for the sake of it. The Chosen One prophecy is over and done with by this point in the timeline before Revenge of the Sith even happens. Wait, no, Sheev, you're forgetting the part where the father says, You have brought balance to this world. You will do it again for the galaxy. Yeah, but that doesn't really answer my question. How? If the way in which he brought balance on Mortis was by equalizing the power dynamic to zero, then what exactly did he do at any later point in his life to balance the Force on a larger scale? Was it killing Palpatine? How does that equate to this arc's definition of balance? Do you guys see what I mean? Dave thinks leaving these questions unanswered makes the mythology seem more mystical, but he's introduced all these concepts that are incongruent with the films. And if this was the moment the prophecy was fulfilled and it really was taken care of before episode 3, then that only raises even more questions. Like, hey Obi-Wan, you were there, remember? All three of them retained their memories of this event, which means that Obi-Wan watched Anakin be confirmed as the Chosen One. So why does he still act like it's up in the air if the prophecy is even true? Why does he still act like Anakin hasn't yet fulfilled it and that destroying the Sith is the only way to achieve balance? I know you guys are gonna say that I'm being deliberately obtuse here, but the thing is, if I were to ask Dave Filoni right now to define these terms, I'm pretty sure he'd say something along the lines of, the Force works in mysterious ways or some other non-answer. And even if I were to get him to give me a clear, straight answer, he'd probably say that Mortis wasn't the real real fulfillment of the Chosen One prophecy and defer to George and probably say it was all metaphorical or something. At which point I would just be annoyed at having had my time wasted with three thematically and conceptually confused episodes of television that don't have a clear idea of what they want to say and aren't even in line with the original interpretation of this narrative as intended by the author. But if I could reel us all the way back to talking about the characters, I'd like to take a look at how Anakin is written in this story and what larger effect this arc has on him and the rest of the show, which is a statement that would imply that it does affect him in later episodes, but actually the events of the Mortis trilogy are only ever brought up again once throughout the rest of the series. Spoke with Master Qui-Gon Jinn on Mortis, did you not? We don't think it was actually him, rather an illusion. A mind trick formed out of our memories. Despite the fact that you'd think this arc is one of the most pivotal, game-changing events to have ever happened to these three characters, none of them seem to really give it much thought once they leave Mortis. We never see them talk about it or what it means, we never see what the other Jedi think about the matter, we never see any of them discussing whether or not it means that Anakin really is the Chosen One and whether or not he already brought balance to the Force by killing the Sun, thereby rendering his status as the Chosen One somewhat obsolete in future events. This is a problem that I have more broadly with this show. The arcs are so isolated for the most part that you typically won't ever see them brought up again, unless it's in a direct continuation of said story in a future arc. There are some exceptions to this rule, but for the most part what happens in one story will often be ignored or entirely forgotten by the next. And that's mostly fine if it's a low stakes, run of the mill mission like fighting battle droids and liberating yet another planet, because at this point that's all in a day's work for these characters. 
characters. But when Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka meet a bunch of force gods, and when Anakin fucking turns to the dark side after seeing a vision of the future that he later forgets, you'd think this is the kind of stuff that would be worth reflecting on, and it would be nice to actually see that reflection also, maybe, perhaps. And yet, you heard me right, Anakin is given a vision of the future by the sun that shows him everything he does in episode 3 and what he will eventually become, and what he chooses to do with that information in order to prevent it from happening is to turn to the dark side and wipe out the Jedi. Hey, wait a minute. I have seen that it is the Jedi who will stand in the way of peace. Oh. I don't know what that means. His motivations aren't really clear here. Like, if he's seeing the future where he becomes a Sith and destroys the Jedi and is trying to prevent that, why would his motivation be to kill all the Jedi. Uh, but either way, he turns evil for a while and even fights Obi-Wan surrounded by lava. It's just like episode three! This vision of the future is later erased from his memory, but like I already said, everything else that happens in this arc is remembered by all three of them by the end. So you can't even chalk it up to some weird dream that just Anakin had because all three of them had it and have the exact same memory of the events. You'd think maybe they'd want to know what would drive Anakin to turn to the dark side and try to eradicate the Jedi. Like that, like that would be kind of concerning, maybe? And you know what? All of that might not even be the most significant thing that happened to these characters on Mortis. Ahsoka dies. She gets turned temporarily evil as well, not by any visions of the future, just like, she gets bitten. And then when the son no longer has any use for her, he kills her. But then the daughter is also dying, so she decides she wants to transfer her life force into Ahsoka, and the father, through Anakin, is able to resurrect Ahsoka in the daughter's final act of goodness. Now, I know these days, dying and coming back to life is basically just an average Tuesday for Ahsoka, but back in the day, death used to actually mean something in Star Wars. This should be treated as nothing short of a miracle, and should call into question so many things, but they all three just kind of shrug it off. What's going on? Uh, not much. Oh. I'd imagine having died and being promptly resurrected might take a toll on Ahsoka, be it physical, emotional, or both, but you wouldn't know it by looking at her. We never see her reflect on the fact that she was dead for a few minutes and what that might mean for her. It's just never brought up again. But in regards to Anakin and Obi-Wan, there is so much more to unpack here. This should have been a fucking game changer for Anakin. He brought someone back from the dead. Now yes, we already established earlier that being on Mortis amplifies force abilities to their nth degree and he was guided in the process by a god, so I'm not suggesting that Anakin should just be able to to do this from now on, but this is still a hugely significant event that presumably no Jedi has ever seen before, and should call into question their very perception of the Force and what its wielders are capable of. I mean, I guess you could say that maybe this solidified Anakin's belief that cheating death was possible, which only further motivated him in Episode 3, but still. And what does this mean for his character? Was he not given Ahsoka as an apprentice specifically so that he could learn to let go of attachments? Let's just hope Anakin is ready for this responsibility. Ready he is to teach an apprentice to let go of his pupil. A greater challenge it will be. Master this. Skywalker mess. You'd think Obi-Wan would be more concerned with the fact that Anakin just bent the Force to his will to undo her death, which is an inherently dark side trait. Something that maybe the Jedi Council might want to know about. Something that should have all the Jedi deeply concerned about how far Anakin is willing to go to save the people that he loves. There's a character from the EU that I can't help being reminded of named Cade Skywalker, a descendant of Anakin who lived about 140 years after the OT. Cade was one of the most powerful Force users to ever live, and one such ability he possessed that made him so desirable to the villain of that era is that he could bring people back from the brink of death by sheer force of will, bending the force unnaturally in order to achieve a result that most might consider to be a good outcome. Every time Cade does this, it's seen as a bad thing, because instead of allowing the natural order to take shape and letting go of the people he cares about, he's twisting the force into his tool in order to save others, and is therefore giving in to the dark side. The entire reason that George described the dark side as 
imbalance way back in that clip I referenced earlier is because the selfish person who uses the dark side for their own gain is imposing their will onto the Force, rather than letting it guide the universe in its natural state. The point I'm ultimately trying to make here is that, according to George's own definitions on how the Force operates, what Anakin does here is not a good thing, and yet it's treated as a triumphant moment. Yay, Ahsoka's back, woohoo! And I wouldn't even see this as that big of an issue if the characters actually acknowledged what happened, and if Anakin's decision had wrought actual consequences that would go on to affect him or Ahsoka throughout the rest of the show. Maybe this feat opened a gateway in his spirit that pushed him even further to the dark side, and or maybe it had some physical effect on him that continues to grow more apparent as time goes on. Once again, it all falls back to the central point that I'm making. Nothing in this arc really has any lasting impact on the larger story, despite this possibly being the most important event to ever take place in these characters' lives. I considered saving talking about the Mortis trilogy for later because I have a whole category planned going over the concepts introduced in this series that completely damage the whole of Star Wars, but I decided instead to place it here because this should have been one of the most significant things to ever happen to Anakin, and instead it's treated as little more than a cliff note. Honestly, it feels more like bad fan fiction than anything else. Like, so then Anakin, Obi-Wan, and my OC go to this super ultra powerful force planet and meet force gods, uh, and then Anakin goes berserk on the force gods because he's because uh, the Chosen One, and balance and stuff, uh, and then my OC gets turned to the dark side and dies, but uh, but it's fine because she, uh, Anakin can bring her back, and he's, because he's cool, uh, not as cool as my OC, but, but cool, uh, and then Anakin actually finds out about Darth Vader, but uh, he forgets by the end, so it's okay, it's the episode three's still intact. And then, uh, and then all the Force gods die, and then they leave, and it's like nothing ever happened. The end. So just to summarize, the main character traits given to Anakin in the films are either completely ignored, underdeveloped, or outright contradicted. If it's not the events in the story actively sending a different message than the intended themes, then it's a concept that deserves a much deeper exploration than this show decides it has time for. So it's taken out of the oven prematurely and the undercooked mess is displayed for all the world to see. On top of that, Anakin receives no sufficient development at any point and ends the series in exactly the same place he started in despite that being a far cry from who his character was just a few weeks earlier in Attack of the Clones. Any attempts to meaningfully develop him are few and far between, and not nearly enough to combat the ratio of episodes where he's given nothing to chew on. The term wasted opportunity doesn't even really do Anakin's character justice, but it's one that I want you all to keep in mind anyway, because it's going to define a lot of the problems with this show going forward. Uh, quick disclaimer, I wrote this entire section long before the Ahsoka show ever came out, and I decided not to change it because I wanted you guys to see my thoughts on her character, untainted by how she's portrayed later on in the Disney canon, barring, you know, Mando and Book of Boba Fett, because obviously those existed when I wrote this. Um, so yeah. Ahsoka is a hard character to talk about. The thing is, there was once a time when Ahsoka was up there as one of my favorite Star Wars characters, and while I wouldn't really rank her that high nowadays, I actually do still like her a lot, despite her overuse and general lack of narrative purpose since her tenure on Rebels. But the thing is, most of what I like about this character comes from Rebels, and as a kid I never really found her all that interesting or compelling until this arc. And since we're here to talk about the Clone Wars, we'll shelve her later characterization in Rebels and take a look at what this show does with her. The general sentiment has always seemed to be that while she started off as a pesky and annoying kid, she gradually improved over time throughout this show and became a welcome addition to the Star Wars mythos. But to be honest, I really don't think I agree with that. I don't think Ahsoka was ever badly written until season 7, which we'll get to, but I also don't think that there's enough meat given to her before, again, that arc. A common problem with this show that I sort of alluded to earlier is that, due to its nature as an anthology series, plot lines and character arcs will be developed, or at least the beginnings of something resembling that will take shape, and then we'll go a season or more without getting any more than that, like with the Rush Clovis stuff and dealing with Anakin and Padme's relationship. So 
such as unfortunately the case for Ahsoka as well. Because when we talk about Ahsoka's character development, the episodes and arcs that people tend to point to are typically few and far between, separated by at least half a season or more. I would say season 5 is the most compact when it comes to Ahsoka stories, with three whole arcs dedicating to fleshing her out right before she leaves the show for an entire season. And in between all these arcs where she's given minimal to decent characterization, there's a whole lot of nothing. She's certainly in a lot of the episodes in between, but she's not really given a lot to do, and she doesn't grow or change in any of them because status quo or whatever. Like, here's a perfect example. Remember how I mentioned earlier that she found out Anakin used to be a slave in the Zygeria arc, which was four seasons into the show? She and Anakin had been working together for some time by that point, and one of the most instrumental elements of his backstory is something that he never shared with her because he didn't like talking about it. And it's something pretty consequential that she's just learned. You'd think she'd have more to say about the matter than the very brief conversation she has with Obi-Wan, but... Nah. Fun fact, this arc was originally a comic book that came out around the same time as season one, and it just got adapted into the show because... why not? I guess. But in said comic, there's a scene at the end where Ahsoka actually talks to Anakin about his past and what that must have been like. He opens up to her a bit, and we even get a cute little dialogue exchange where they both promise to actually do something about slavery once the war is over and they actually have time to devote to non-separatist matters. Which is pretty sad when you remember how things end up between them, but the more apparent point is that this is a scene that originally was in the story, and I have no idea why they decided not to include it in the show. It almost feels like the writers don't realize you can develop more than one character at a given time, and since this is meant to be an Anakin arc, Ahsoka had to sit on the back burner. But even then, I'm not even sure that's entirely true, because this arc also does plenty to develop Obi-Wan and give him a better understanding of what Anakin's life must have been like before joining with the Jedi, so I know these people understand the concept of accomplishing two things at once. There's also a fair few examples of redundant character work to be found here. To give an example, one of the first episodes in the series to do anything with Ahsoka was in the arc where the Republic are trying to liberate the planet Ryloth from Separatist control. In the first part of that arc, she gets a little big for her britches during a space battle and ignores a direct order from Anakin to return to the ship when he realizes she's about to be overrun. The result is that she ends up getting her entire squad killed and sustains a few minor injuries herself, and of course this is something that she feels really bad for and it causes her to doubt her own capabilities as well as better understand that this war isn't a game and that there are real people under her command who will die if she doesn't take it seriously. She eventually learns to trust herself again and ends up winning the day with a carefully thought out strategy to get through the Separatist blockade and down onto the planet. In terms of character work, I'd call this pretty basic, but I do still think it's neat, and it's a pretty pivotal moment that begins Ahsoka down a path to becoming the more likable, mature version of herself that everyone praises nowadays. However, not even two whole episodes later in the premiere of Season 2, we find her, Anakin, and Obi-Wan fighting on the planet Felucia, with Ahsoka leading her own end of the battle. Anakin and Obi-Wan realize they're outmatched and pull their troops out of the line of fire, radioing for Ahsoka to do the same. She hears their commands, but continues to press on, certain that she'll be able to win the day, because she's unable to see what her masters see, which is that the droids she's fighting are about to be reinforced, and she and all of her men will be killed. This is only avoided when Anakin and Obi-Wan use their own troops to cover Ahsoka and her clones in a retreat, and she's promptly reprimanded for her actions, and is temporarily temporarily suspended by the Jedi Council and put on library duty. It's nice to know that even after that entire arc of self-doubt and picking herself back up again, all of that development was completely undone in the very next story arc. And I can already hear the same people who defended Luke and TLJ saying that characters are allowed to relearn lessons because nobody's perfect, blah blah blah. But it's a bit frustrating when you're binging the show and you go directly from Ahsoka learning this particular lesson and growing from it to her learning it again and growing from it again. Plus, if we're not going to give her more than a handful of episodes each season to flesh out her character, can we have her, I don't know, learn different lessons rather than wasting my time with the same thing I already watched? The whole reason this entire thing happened at all was so that she'd be scolded by the council and put on library duty so that she could be in the place where the plot is about to happen, but I see no reason why she had to learn the same exact lesson as last time to accomplish this goal. There are plenty of other ways to fuck up. You could just have her get in trouble some other way 
play. Be creative. Like I said earlier, one of the biggest problems I have with how Ahsoka's characterized is that the episodes that do develop her are few and far between, and I don't think there's a better representation of that issue than with two of the major villains she faces on this show, Barris and Darth Maul. Their cases are different, but the main issue I'm highlighting here is persistent in both. Neither of them have a well-developed relationship with Ahsoka, so the impact that they leave on her in their respective confrontations falls kind of flat. Let's start with Maul because he's a much easier case, and because he's going to be getting his own section in this category a bit later. I don't think Maul is badly characterized in the show at all, and in fact, I like a lot of the things they do with him here. His story is also symmetrical with Ahsoka's, which is highlighted during their confrontation in Siege of Mandalore, but before that arc, which serves as the finale of the entire show, neither of them have ever interacted even once, and there is very little connective tissue to work with between them. Ahsoka. Tano, is it? I can't say yours is a name familiar to me. The arc admittedly does try its best by making it so that Maul is actually specifically trying to kill Anakin because he knows that Sidious has been grooming him to become his apprentice, and that makes it so that he and Ahsoka both have unique and opposing perspectives on a particular subject that's important to the story. It's something that I find really interesting, but I also can't help but get the impression that the only reason they added it in was so that there'd be something, and it wouldn't just come off as exactly what it is two characters who weren't in Revenge of the Sith getting to do stuff during the events of that film. Regardless, as bad as things are between Ahsoka and Maul here, I'm much more annoyed about Barriss, because she had the potential to be one of the best characters in the entire series had she been you know, a character. In the arc that concluded the show's fifth season, there was a bombing on the Jedi Temple that Ahsoka ended up taking the fall for, forcing her on the run, which only served to incriminate her even further in the eyes of the Republic and the Jedi Order. When she was eventually captured, the Jedi held a trial for her in which they expelled her from the Order so that she could be tried in a Republic tribunal, per the requests of Admiral Tarkin. Anakin eventually discovered the truth that it was in fact Barriss who had framed Ahsoka, and so Ahsoka was freed of all charges and offered a place back in the Order. And offered that she refused, which led to one of the most heartfelt scenes in the entire series, where she and Anakin said their goodbyes, and Anakin was forced to let her walk away and potentially never see her again. Not only does this arc do wonders for Ahsoka's overall development in propelling her toward a life of agency and independence with a strong belief in doing what's right, even when it goes against the powers that be, but it also nicely wraps up the entire point of why Anakin was given a Padawan in the first place, to learn to deal with attachments and let go of the people he cares about, which is all stuff we went over earlier when talking about Anakin's character. However, what's annoying is that the person who instigated this arc for Ahsoka was someone who barely had any screen time with her, nor was she even in that much of the show in her own right. This was meant to be a stinging moment where Ahsoka's supposed good friend and peer, who's been with her through thick and thin, turns out to have been the one causing her all this pain and suffering. And I wish it was, but I'm sorry, the relationship between these two characters is very thin, and what could have been a pretty impactful moment ended up just confusing me, really. When talking about the friendship between these two characters, people instantly point to the arc in Season 2, where they, along with their respective Jedi Masters, Anakin and Luminara, are sent to Geonosis to destroy yet another droid factory that the Separatists are building in secret. During this mission, Ahsoka and Barriss meet for the first time, and are together on their part of the mission to plant charges inside the factory, which eventually goes awry when they're attacked by Geonosians and end up getting buried alive beneath the caverns. This episode serves to accomplish two things, and I think it does them both pretty well. It establishes the beginnings of a friendship between Barriss and Ahsoka, as well as juxtaposing their relationship with their respective masters. With Luminara being much more strict and rigid with Barriss, while Anakin is more lax and willing to treat Ahsoka like a peer. More on that in a bit. And it also works to further develop Anakin's unwillingness to let go of Ahsoka, if there's even a chance that the Padawans can still be saved. Whereas Luminara is approaching things from a much more practical Jedi mindset, trying to guide Anakin to accept the loss of his Padawan one should the time ever come. If you haven't already gotten the idea, Luminara is a great representation of basically everything wrong with the Jedi of that era, and so her dynamic with Anakin does a good job of showcasing the differences between them and their outlooks on the Order and on the Will of the Force, while also juxtaposing between their respective methodologies when training their students. The next episode then follows Ahsoka and Barriss immediately after the Geonosis mission. Upon destroying the factory and completing the objective and capturing Poggle, Kiati Mundi gets word that Master 
Windu needs medical supplies delivered to him on Dantooine, and says that they can deliver the supplies by going to a medical station near Ord Cestus. Anakin notes that Cestus isn't exactly on the way to Coruscant, and that they need to get Poggle back to Coruscant as quickly as possible so they can begin debriefing him. So they hatch the idea to send Ahsoka and Barriss to the medical frigate and deliver the supplies to Windu while the Masters return directly to Coruscant with Poggle as their prisoner. However, things take a turn for the worst when a few clones are possessed by Geonosian brain worms before leaving the planet, which basically take over their minds and turn them into zombies. This parasite then spreads throughout the ship, possessing all of the other clones, and Ahsoka and Barriss find themselves fighting side by side against their own men on a ship with limited places to run and hide. What follows is an episode that I really enjoy, where the two have to work together to figure out how to save the clones, which once again helps build the bond between these characters. And this might be superficial praise, but I like watching a pair of Jedi have to fight against a bunch of clones, foreshadowing Order 66. It also foreshadows the actual circumstances surrounding Ahsoka's experience in Order 66, though I'm not exactly sure how intentional that was. Point being that that's the main purpose of this arc, and it's rightfully touted as one of the best of the early seasons. My personal hot take would probably be that it's one of the best of the entire show, simply by the fact that it doesn't break any continuity, ignoring the EU, which we already said we were going to do at the beginning of this video. But to bring us back to my point, the problem with Ahsoka and Barriss' friendship is that it's never developed any further beyond this. Barriss doesn't even appear in any episodes between this arc and this arc, and yet I'm supposed to care that this supposed good friend of Ahsoka's set her up for a crime she didn't commit and ruined her entire life? They should have had a lot more screen time together. This betrayal should have felt like a punch to the gut. We, the audience, should have felt betrayed by this. In an ideal world, this wouldn't have even been the first time they met. I'd have probably been developing this relationship as soon as possible, give them at least one arc in season one. But once they're friends, I want these characters to get paired up more, sometimes with their masters, and we can get more development on the contrasting dynamics between the two pairs, and sometimes just by themselves. I'd have even appreciated some lower stakes episodes where maybe Ahsoka and Barriss sneak out of the temple late at night and go to a carnival or something, engage in a little teenage rebellion because they are still kids after all. Build their fucking friendship. Don't just tell me it exists off screen. And I want episodes that focus just on Barriss without Ahsoka because simply telling me that she randomly decided that the Jedi had fallen away from their ideals isn't really enough. I want to know why she believes this, why she chose to hurt innocents to send this message, and why she framed her supposed best friend for the crime. Like, she could have pinned it on any Jedi, or none at all. We see in the scene where she killed Leta Termon that she could have just silenced her without involving Ahsoka or anyone else in her plot, so... Why? I thought these two were supposed to be friends, and maybe she grew to resent the Jedi and their role in the war, but if anything, wouldn't she want Ahsoka to be on her side? Wouldn't she want her to see reason as she has instead of setting her up and destroying her life? Well, in my version, I would want to work to not just develop their friendship, but I'd also plant the seeds of Barriss's ever-growing resentment toward Ahsoka from the very beginning. Think back to earlier when I highlighted the different methodology between Anakin and Luminara's teaching styles. Luminara's pragmatic and rigid ways are a great foil to Anakin's more unorthodox outlook on life in general, but that goes further in the way that they choose to instruct their Padawans. Like I said, she's much more strict with Barriss, and treated her basically like she was disposable when it looked like she and Ahsoka weren't making it off Geonosis alive. Maybe Barriss sees the casual way in which Anakin confides in Ahsoka and trusts her to get the job done while also being kind and sincere, and it makes her hate her for it. It awakens a jealousy that she doesn't even initially notice, but it slowly festers over the years the more missions the four go on together. Eventually, when all that boils over, she decides to take Ahsoka down a peg because she feels that she deserves it. And this would all be stuff that I'd want Barriss to actually say to Ahsoka at some point after everything is revealed. You guys know I love a good villain monologue. I'd also want to use Luminara as exactly what she is, a representation of the failings of the Jedi Order that Barriss would grow to despise. And as this senseless war drags on, she starts to see every Jedi like she sees Luminara, and it disgusts her. In the notorious middle arc of Season 7, where Ahsoka meets Trace and Rafa Martez, we find out that the sisters' parents were apparently killed in a speeder accident caused by the Jedi as they were pursuing Zero the Hutt during the episode where he was broken out of prison. After Zero escaped, a Jedi Master came to visit Trace and Rafa and basically told them shit happens. And it's never outright stated, but it's heavily implied that the Jedi in question was Luminara. She was beautiful. Dark robes contrasting against her light green skin. 
penetrating eyes. I know they probably didn't plan this far ahead, considering Trace and Rafa were originally a completely different character that got turned into two people, but I think that this should have been an episode. I would have liked to actually see this happen, and for Barris to have watched as her master basically dismiss two crying orphans after causing their parents' death, and that would be the first of many seeds planted that would make her eventually realize the Jedi are corrupt and need to be stopped, as they ultimately do more harm than good. For some reason, a lot of these episodes from C Season 1 to 3 are out of order, which always confused me as a kid, and I wish they'd have just released them all chronologically, but alas. The episode I just mentioned where Zero the Hut is broken out of prison happens in the finale of Season 1, but it doesn't take place chronologically until Season 3, with Season 3 Episode 9 serving as a direct continuation of it. And because of this, there are a handful of other episodes in the third season that serve as completely unnecessary prequels to the breakout that I absolutely despise. There's one where Ahsoka foils an assassin plot against Padme ordered by Zero from prison, which is meant to set up that he has connections that allows him to hire bounty hunters even while in Republic custody. Though it's weird because at the end of the same episode, Aura Singh was apprehended and promptly thrown in prison, yet she was part of the team that ended up breaking him out, so did she escape? If it's that easy to break out of the prison, why didn't Aura just break him out then? Why did she break out and then join a team that are actively working on breaking someone out of the same prison that she just escaped. Anyway, the reason I brought all this up is because Season 3, Episode 8 is an episode that I detest with every fiber of my being. It follows C-3PO and R2-D2 through the lower levels of Coruscant to find a specific kind of fruit to put on a cake so that it can be served at a party Padme is throwing, and this specific fruit is necessary. It can't be any other fruit or else the dignitary that Padme is trying to negotiate with will be very unhappy. The stakes are really high, guys. So our two fucks off to a droid spa while 3PO is captured by Cad Bane, who needs access to the plans to the Senate building so he can stage the hostage crisis that we see in Season 1. And instead of simply grabbing a flash drive and downloading the information from his brain, since, you know, he's a droid, he starts fucking torturing 3PO for the information that he wants? And then after finally figuring out how technology works, Bane finds out that 3PO doesn't even have the schematics to the Senate building, so he sends his droid back to the spa and kidnaps R2, who has the data he's looking for, apparently. Once he gets what he wants, he erases both of their memories of the events so that Anakin and Padme are none the wiser, the droids obtain the correct fruit, and the party is saved. Hooray! My issue with this episode aside, look at the little dance these cook droids do when they complete the cake. They're so happy, I love them. Anyway, the entire point of that episode was to show us how Bane got a copy of the Senate building schematics, which is something that we didn't need to see, and which actively makes Bane's character that much worse for having been stupid enough to torture a robot for information rather than just downloading it. You could have easily replaced that worthless aneurysm of an episode with the one I just pitched, and I think it would have been a lot better. Anyway, I briefly touched on this earlier, but there are a lot of arcs on this show that present certain concepts, but don't have any idea what they actually want to say about them or how to convey those messages properly, and what you get as a result is a crudely crafted, disjointed series of episodes that constantly contradict themselves and give you tonal whiplash, such as the case with a particular arc that handles Ahsoka's character in Season 5. The basic premise of this arc is that there's a group of rebels fighting against the Separatist occupation on Onderon and have reached out to the Jedi Council for help. Seeing that insurgent cells just like them are popping up on various different worlds, Anakin pitches the idea to send Jedi there and train them in guerrilla warfare, figuring that if they can get enough of these cells to fight against the Separatists on their end, the droid army would essentially be fighting a war on two fronts on several different worlds, making it a lot easier for the Republic to win the war. The Jedi decide to use the Onderon rebel group as an experiment, sending Anakin, Obi-Wan, Ahsoka, and Rex to train them up while never actually interfering, the basic idea being that if the Jedi have to involve themselves in any way beyond simply guiding them on the right path, then the entire exercise is pointless and therefore not worth exploring. This is a really interesting idea for an episode, and upon this most recent rewatch, I was actually really excited to see how this particular concept was executed. Hey look, Saw Save the dream! So I was pretty disappointed to find out that it's not. 
it's, it's not well executed. This arc really doesn't seem to know what it wants to do with its premise, and it shows. The second the droids find the rebel camp and attack them, Anakin is immediately ready to fight them off, but Obi-Wan is smart about it and tells him that they can't, which makes total sense. But then, not two seconds later, he turns to Stila and offers to hold them off for them while the rebels run, which, like seems to conflict with what you just said. Now, to be fair, Obi-Wan's exact words were, No, Anakin. We can only protect them. We cannot fight this war for them. And I guess that covering their retreat falls under the category of protecting them, but then my question would be, how involved are they allowed to be exactly? Because I don't see how protecting them is any different than fighting the war for them in this case. If you so much as kill one battle droid that might have made all the difference in Separatist victory, then the experiment becomes moot. And it causes me to wonder why we ever see Jedi fighting any droids in these episodes, which happens a lot. Like, you might say I'm being pedantic, but the parameters of this experiment are that these rebels need to be able to beat back the droid army without any Republic help, and should that fail to be the case, then this whole idea was a waste of time. And in that case, there is no meaningful difference between protecting them so they can live to fight another day, and actively participating in the war effort. In fact, in the middle of the arc, they leave the planet to advise from afar, but they leave Ahsoka there so that she can continue physically helping them. Officially, she's just there to advise them, but she still actively participates in their missions, and without her interference, the Rebels wouldn't have stood a chance at overthrowing their king. Again, I'm just not clear at how much the Jedi are allowed to involve themselves, because the fact that they're able to to at all makes me question why they can't just capture the king themselves and make this fight a whole lot easier for them. I mean, if they're able to sneak onto a Separatist-controlled world and into the main city in which the king lives, then clearly it wouldn't be that hard. But then it's made even more confusing when Ahsoka reaches out to them and asks for supplies, and again, Anakin wants to send help, but Obi-Wan is against the idea for the obvious practical reasons. But then, Anakin argues that they can help Ahsoka without the Separatists knowing that they were involved which... What? Anakin, did you forget the point of the exercise, which was your idea? It's not about whether or not the Separatists know you're involved. In fact, you made sure they did when you left your Padawan there and had her actively help the Rebels with her lightsabers. It kind of seems like she's fighting the war for them, doesn't it? And for some reason, this idea convinces Obi-Wan to send the supplies to the Rebels, despite the fact that it didn't actually address the reason he didn't want to in the first place. What difference does it make now? The Separatists know we're involved. It doesn't have to look like we're the ones helping. The Separatists know we're involved. It doesn't have to look like we're the ones helping. The Separatists know we're involved. Doesn't have to look like we're the ones helping. And instead of sending them himself and risking exposing his involvement that the enemy already knows about, Jedi. doesn't have to look like Anakin goes to the pirate Hondo and has him deliver the supplies. Just, just why? Did, did the writers forget what the premise of the story was right at the very end? So thanks to the help of the Jedi, the Rebels win the day, despite the loss of their leader, which Ahsoka's pretty bummed about, but that's basically it. And the events of this episode don't really seem to affect her that much beyond that, which I find so disappointing. Because had this arc stayed consistent with its entire point, there could have been some really, really interesting stuff done with her character. Imagine with me, if you will, a version of this story where Anakin and Obi-Wan stick to their guns and refuse to aid Ahsoka. And as a result, the rebels are overrun by the droid army and they lose the war. Maybe Stila still dies like originally, only this time the rebels blame the Jedi and take that out on Ahsoka, casting their anger onto her while she starts to see a fatal flaw in the order that she serves. When we find her in the Siege of Mandalore, her main point of contention with Obi-Wan is that he and the other Jedi have become so caught up in this war that they're prioritizing the needs of the Republic over the needs of the people. And as such, they've lost sight of their original purpose, which is to serve all life. What if the seeds of those beliefs were planted here after the crushing defeat of the rebels? This would cause Lux to hate her and Saw to feel betrayed and decide that the Republic and Separatists are no different from one another, better informing his resentment toward what would eventually become the Empire. And it would start Ahsoka on an arc where she starts to really see that the authority figures that she used to blindly follow without question are actually fallible and short-sighted. And then after she leaves the Jedi Order, maybe she goes back 
back to Onderon and rejoins the cause to overthrow the Separatist occupation, with Saw and Lux hesitant to trust her initially. I mean, that right there could have been its own arc, and I would have greatly preferred that over watching her run around chasing a loader bot through the lower levels of Coruscant. Maybe along the way she joins forces with the Night Owls, who end up helping them with their fight in exchange for her help in reclaiming Mandalore. I mean, you'd have to figure out some reason for Bo-Katan and company to get involved on Onderon, but I don't really see that being that hard, considering both Ahsoka and Lux have met her by this point in the timeline. Though, of course, Lux would likely not be too keen on working with her again after the last experience he had with Death Watch. But that's all something that could have hypothetically been used for some decent drama and conflict. Give them a reason to work together, and they'll learn to trust each other. And you could even use Obi-Wan's trust in Bo as a good enough reason for Ahsoka to vouch for her, so I don't know. The point I'm trying to make is that there are pieces here to work with. But that leads me right into what I would consider to be the worst arc on the show in terms of what it does for Ahsoka's character. And before you crucify me, please just hear me out on this one. The Siege of Mandalore is, of course, the final arc in the entire series, and follows Ahsoka leading a portion of the 501st Legion in an attack on Mandalore in an attempt to arrest Maul and bring him back to the Republic to face justice. And it's touted as one of, if not the greatest pieces of storytelling in all of Star Wars by many people, including me once upon a time. But while I think there are still plenty of aspects to praise about this arc, there's a lot wrong with it. And unfortunately, Ahsoka's characterization in these episodes is one of the worst things about it. So let's set the scene. Ahsoka left the Order at the very end of Season 5, and we don't see her again until the arc directly before this one, where she gets into shenanigans with a pair of insufferable sisters and gets roped in with the Pike Syndicate. And since the Pikes are part of Maul's larger criminal enterprise, that gives her reason to accidentally bump into Bo-Katan. And at the end of the arc, she's recruited to the cause of retaking Mandalore. They go to Anakin and Obi-Wan for help, figuring that they'd want in on the capture of Maul, even despite the countless treaties the Republic and Mandalore have with each other that would prohibit a siege. But before a decision is ever made, Obi-Wan races into the room and informs Anakin that the Chancellor has been kidnapped by General Grievous and they've been called back to rescue him. Ahsoka then accuses Obi-Wan of playing politics by prioritizing the needs of the Chancellor over the needs of the people of Mandalore, which is something that I would be fine with were it not for you know, the context. Now, Ahsoka's ability to think for herself and question authority is actually a strength of her character, and it's managed to save the day in moments where doing what she was told would have cost our heroes dearly. But in this particular instance, she seems to be completely ignoring the fact that Coruscant is currently being attacked by the Separatists, and a lot of people are going to die. Like, Ahsoka, you realize this affects more than just the Senators, right? There are people on that planet who will be killed in the ensuing battle. The amount of citizens living on Coruscant, including the two friends that you just made in the last arc, who talked about how Jedi negligence caused the death of their parents, is significantly higher than the population of one Mandalorian city. And that's before even accounting for the fact that if Coruscant is taken by the Separatists, they have a good chance of winning the war, which would cause the entire galaxy to be subject by Count Dooku. That's a lot worse than one planet being ruled by Darth Maul. I understand if you want to argue that Ahsoka isn't meant to be thinking reasonably here, but this is not a character flaw that's ever explored or reflected on at any later point in the story. Her moral grandstanding against Obi-Wan is never brought up again, and she never stops to think about why he might prioritize one trillion actual Republic citizens over a few thousand Mandalorians who he's not even allowed to help without potentially sparking another war. Oh yeah, that's right, I kind of skipped over this, but in the earlier scene that established the fact that the Republic can't be allowed to intervene in Mandalorian affairs, Obi-Wan makes it pretty clear why this is the case, as is consistent with the established position Mandalore has taken on the Clone Wars throughout this entire show. If Republic forces aid you in your assault, it will break treaties that are a hundred years old. We will effectively be drawn into yet another war. I understand why Bo-Katan is fine with this, because she doesn't care about anything other than reclaiming Mandalore, but you'd think Ahsoka might stop to reflect on whether or not it's a good idea to force the Republic into another war when they're not even finished with their first one yet. She would know better than most how taxing this war has been on the Republic and the people fighting in it, considering she was one of them. She fought alongside the very same Jedi and clones who are being spread thin by the current war, and now she wants 
wants to pull them into another one just to save one planet. Again, you can argue all you want that this hypocrisy is intentional, but I still don't see anywhere in the narrative where it's ever addressed, so I don't think I care much for that point. And I think the only reason this argument she had with Obi-Wan was even written wasn't to highlight a flaw in her character. It was to facilitate a reason to have Rex and a portion of the 501st divided up and sent to help Ahsoka on Mandalore to better explain where Rex was during Revenge of the Sith. This argument needed to happen so that Anakin would come up with that solution, and it even played upon an actual theme about the Jedi that the prequels were trying to go for, but it did so very badly. So that's the first of two major issues that I have with Ahsoka's character here, but for the second, we're gonna have to skip to a lot later. So she goes to Mandalore, the city is liberated, they capture Maul, and Ahsoka is en route to take him back to Coruscant. He's been put inside of a box that's apparently designed specifically to hold Force-sensitive prisoners from back in ancient times when the Mandalorians went to war with the Jedi, and as the ship is in transit, BAM! Order 66 goes down. Ahsoka is able to get away from Rex and the rest of the clones by escaping through the vents and finds herself trapped with no good means of escape. This arc makes a point to show that Ahsoka is unwilling to kill any clones, as she tells Rex once she managed to remove his inhibitor chip. The following events show them both finding creative ways of incapacitating the clones without killing them, which I suppose is more than can be said the rest of the Jedi did. I mean, there are a few moments where some of the clones clearly aren't surviving the damage that's being dealt by Ahsoka, but that's easy enough to forgive given the severity of the situation. The best that can be done is to minimize the casualties as much as possible. So why oh why did she set Maul free and send him loose into the ship to distract the clones trying to kill her? Like, she specifically doesn't give Maul a weapon when he asks for one because she says she's not rooting for him, but Ahsoka, what exactly is this meant to accomplish? Yes, Maul will buy you some time, but at the cost of the clones' lives. You think just because Maul doesn't have a lightsaber that he can't still do significant damage to these people who you're ostensibly trying to spare if you can? Like I said, collateral damage along the way is basically inevitable, so I'm okay if she has to kill some clones even if she doesn't want to and is actively avoiding doing so. But as far as I'm concerned, every clone Maul kills is her fault. And that's a pretty big number considering every single clone ended up dying thanks to Maul destroying the hyperdrive and causing the ship to crash. Like, good job, Ahsoka, you set a mad lunatic free and he killed all of your friends as a result, you fucking moron. Like, I really don't know what you want me to say here. What's the alternative? The alternative is letting Maul die and figuring out some other way off the ship. We've already seen that you will kill clones if push comes to shove, but that doesn't mean you have to sick a Sith Lord on them. I'm pretty sure the only reason this happened is because Maul obviously can't die here, but then again, they also had no reason to write it so that the clones were ordered to execute him, so. I mean, it easily could have been written that Palpatine wanted him brought back to Coruscant alive, or just even have Maul escape by himself somehow. I mean, they invented the fact that he was in an inescapable Jedi holding box, so just don't write that. Don't deal damage to one of your main characters just to facilitate a contrivance when there are dozens of other options in front of you. You were not boxed into a corner with this one, Dave. You could have easily found another way, but instead, Ahsoka Tano is now the sole reason reason that Maul survived the Clone Wars. So Ahsoka didn't escape the Siege of Mandalore completely unscathed, but I wouldn't exactly say these episodes ruined her. They were just a rough patch in an otherwise pretty okay character, whose development in this series could have used a bit more, uh, development. More episodes spent actually fleshing her out, teaching her more than just the same repetitive lessons, and actually giving her and Barriss some form of a relationship. That's basically all I have to say about Ahsoka, but since we're already here, and because I recognize that it's a bit of a hot take to say Siege of Mandalore isn't quite up to snuff, Fuck it, let's just get into this arc a little bit further before we move on to the next category. So the first thing I want to ask is, what exactly was Maul's plan? Like, seriously think about this, what does Maul want to accomplish in this arc, and what methods does he take to bring about that end result? He apparently has a vision which informs him that Anakin is going to turn evil and become Sidious's new apprentice, and so he wants to bait Obi-Wan and Anakin into coming to Mandalore so that he can kill him and deprive Palpatine of Vader. And the way he goes about doing this is by showing up on Mandalore and hoping the Jedi find out he's there. The only reason Anakin and Obi-Wan are made aware that Maul's on Mandalore is through Ahsoka, who only knows about it because of Bo-Katan, and without Ahsoka being there to vouch for her, Bo wouldn't have gone to the Jedi for help. I know she and Obi-Wan have the vague outline of a friendship by this point, but I don't think that would have been enough for her to go to him on her own for two reasons. The first being that, I mean, she literally didn't. Like, she was aware Maul had returned to Mandalore for some time before approaching Ahsoka, and yet never in that time did she decide to contact Obi-Wan 
Obi-Wan on her own, and that implies to me that she wouldn't have done so at all had she not linked up with Ahsoka. The second reason is admittedly working on essentially guesswork, because we really aren't given as much information about this as I think we probably should have been, but the inferences I'm about to make seem pretty intuitive. Obi-Wan last left Bo with the promise that he was going to speak to the Senate on Mandalore's behalf and plead for their help, which obviously didn't end up happening. And I'm sure Obi-Wan tried, but for reasons we already touched on earlier, the Senate wouldn't have been interested in sending aid to a neutral system that represents thousands of other non-affiliated worlds, so that was a bust. Whether Obi-Wan and Bo-Katan ever contacted each other again after the fact isn't clear, but either he called her and let her know it wasn't going to happen, or he didn't say anything to her and she was left to connect the dots herself. Either way, it was pretty clear to her that Obi-Wan wasn't going to be of any help to her, so why would she bother wasting her time asking for it? Until Ahsoka comes along and gives her assurances that she can convince him due to their personal connection. Hell, maybe that's why Bo decided to recruit Ahsoka at all for the mission. But regardless, this all relies on the two of them meeting, and that whole thing was a huge coincidence that Maul couldn't possibly have accounted for. In fact, we know Maul didn't know about it, because when Ahsoka actually does show up, he's surprised to see her. He doesn't even know who she is. So Maul's plan is contingent on two people happening to bump into each other in a whole galaxy, and he didn't even know who one of those people was or that she was a factor at all, so maybe I'm being too harsh though. For all I know, Maul had his own plan for making the Jedi aware of his presence on Mandalore. I, I mean, we don't see it, but I'm sure he had one, and I'm willing to be good faith and just assume that's the case. At which point, I'm simply left to wonder why he thinks they would do anything about it. I mean, I get that they obviously want to capture Maul, but there's that pesky neutral planet drawn into another war debacle I keep hearkening back to because it really does put quite a damper on things. Remember, Obi-Wan already knew Maul was on Mandalore and tried to get the Senate to do something about it, which they didn't, and he never went back there afterwards, so I don't know why Maul suddenly thinks him announcing his presence on Mandalore would change anything. He didn't even sweeten the pot with something that the Republic would consider worth invading the planet over. It's... it's just him. This is something that's kind of just skipped past in the arc, but after Ahsoka and Bo come to them for help, Obi-Wan says he's gonna ask the Council. And we never actually see what they say, but I imagine the answer would have been a resounding no, because obviously. And that's assuming they were even made aware of the request, since the Battle of Coruscant might have already been in full swing by the time Obi-Wan called them. But that's just it. The Battle of Coruscant is the only reason this mission was ever sanctioned. Everything was happening so fast that Obi-Wan was pretty much willing to concede to whatever Ahsoka asked for just to get her off the ship so we could go off to battle, which means that Maul's plan is now contingent on Obi-Wan being in the exact right distracted headspace in order to agree to this mission, and that only happens if Coruscant is attacked, which is something that I don't think Maul knew was going to happen, because if he did, he would have known that Obi-Wan would obviously prioritize going to save the Chancellor over capturing him, so the entire plan is kaput anyway. But then again, what Maul does and doesn't know is intentionally left vague and open for audience interpretation, because like I said in my Ahsoka video, that's the only way Filoni knows how to write. A lot of the information Maul is working with in this arc is based on ambiguous visions, so for all we know, he foresaw that Obi-Wan would learn of his presence and be down to go capture him, but not that he and Anakin wouldn't be coming along. And by the way, I'm not accepting that as a defense, because this arc is making it pretty clear that Maul's predictive powers are pretty on point. Like, other than being wrong about Obi-Wan and Anakin coming along, he pretty much predicted everything that was going to happen, so. Oh, and that's another thing. Why does he just assume Anakin will accompany Obi-Wan, even if they do manage to get the mission approved? Because he hasn't at any other point where Obi-Wan has gone after Maul. What if Anakin was busy with another battle, kind of like the battle he was actively fighting when this arc began? You guys see how these sorts of problems arise regardless of which explanation you employ? Maul risked his own neck on the hope that his dumbass plan would actually work, even though it had almost no chances of going his way at any step along the way. And then, provided they do show up, I guess he was just gonna fight both of them at the same time? Bro, I get that you're cocky, but do you really think you're taking them both on at once when Kenobi has single-handedly kicked your ass by himself several times? I mean, Ahsoka said it best right here. You're lucky Anakin didn't show up. The way you're fighting, you wouldn't have lasted long. Maul seems to only think as far ahead as, I want to get in the same room as them, and then we'll just see what happens. Because when Ahsoka shows up instead of his intended quarry, he's like, okay, I'm going to convince her to join up with me, and then we're going to go fight Sidious, I, I guess. I, I don't really know how that's supposed to work. Are you two just going to waltz into the Chancellor's office and 2v1 him? Do you remember the last time you tried to do that, buddy? Is, is this really the extent of your plan? This is just silly. J just kill her. So throughout the fight, Maul intends 
intentionally holds back against Ahsoka because he still wants her to ally with him. But then right at the very end, he has her at his mercy and offers her one last chance, which she refuses. This means that in no uncertain terms, Maul is now intent on killing Ahsoka. And if you'll notice their current positions, he has every opportunity to do so at no risk to his own personal safety by simply cutting this beam and letting her fall to her death. So what does he do? He lunges forward, makes a bunch of clumsy swings like a child holding a toy lightsaber for the first time, and then she manages to disarm and capture him, so... Great. Just looking to recap here, not only does this arc deal damage to Ahsoka, it also makes Maul a complete idiot, so... Yeah. C can you guys see why I don't actually consider the Siege of Mandalore to be very good, or should I keep going? You know what? We'll shelve it for now because this was meant to be a section talking about Ahsoka's character and that sort of got away from me. But if you want me to delve into this arc more, just let me know and I'll devote a special section to it in part two. For now, I think we have time for one more, so let's round this video out by talking about... I don't have nearly as much to say about Obi-Wan as with the other two, because like I said way earlier in this video, they don't really give him that much development in this series, and that's my biggest complaint. Aside from a few things, there's really not much about this character that you'll learn from the Clone Wars that you didn't already know from the movies. Just like with Anakin, he starts off basically already looking and acting like his Revenge of the Sith self, and just like with Anakin, I find that to be a pretty huge waste because there's a lot of development necessary to bridge this gap in Obi-Wan's story. And of course, most most of you out there probably already know that Obi-Wan is my favorite character in all of fiction, so it's very important to me that they get him right. So while I'm annoyed that they didn't really do much with him, I'm also at least glad the show didn't ruin him, unlike a certain other series we've talked about before. In fact, what little we do learn about him that's not already in the movies, I actually think adds some pretty cool depth to an already great character. I know some people will automatically turn their noses up at the concept of Obi-Wan having an ex-girlfriend, because that does kind of sound like something that a dumb the kids cartoon would make up, but I have zero problems with this. I don't particularly think Satine is a very good character, but I think what she represents for Obi-Wan's story is pretty cool. This is the first time in either the films or the shows where Obi-Wan is faced with someone who might have actually made him question his place in the Jedi Order, and I find that incredibly interesting. I think the moment that fully solidified Obi-Wan's unwavering devotion to the Order was this one right here, and no matter what Satine said or did in the Clone Wars, nothing could have ever made him reconsider it. But it's pretty neat that once upon a time a young, love-struck Obi-Wan might have abandoned the Jedi way for love. The parallels alone that draws to Anakin are obvious, and if anything my one complaint would be that we only ever get one scene where the two ever actually talk about it, despite both of them clearly knowing about each other's respective forbidden loves. This is the one and basically only added layer between these two characters that we never got to see in the movies, and it's worth giving the show a point for. And this is a very personal thing, but one of the main reasons why Obi-Wan has always been my personal favorite character is his refusal to ever give in to the dark side. No matter what happens to him, no matter how many times he's knocked down or how many people he loses, he never lets himself be tempted. He stays true to the light. In the films, he lost his master and he lost his best friend, as well as the only life he'd ever known, and had to spend the rest of his life in exile watching over a living reminder of the apprentice he'd loved like a son and who he'd failed in the end. All of that is already sad enough, but then add on to the pyre that the woman he loved but could never have have died in his arms while he could only stand there watching helplessly, killed by an enemy long since thought dead but who's come back to haunt Obi-Wan from beyond the grave, and that only adds to the tragedy. And so it also adds to that commitment that Obi-Wan has to never fall to the dark side no matter what. For all the many faults that this show has, this will never not be a great moment in a great, if extremely rushed, episode of television. No notes. Absolute Kino. However, while I would say Obi-Wan has handled the best out of every other character on this show by basically default, that doesn't mean he's completely safe. One of the general criticisms I would levy against him is the blatant stupidity he displays during certain arcs when and where the plot demands, and this is an issue that plagues basically every character on this show, most of which to a much larger degree than Obi-Wan, which is why I would still say he got off fairly easily, but it's an issue nonetheless. So let's look at some examples so you can kind of get an idea what I mean. I want to focus on a couple different arcs where not only is Obi-Wan acting uncharacteristically stupid, but also in ways that drastically affect 
affect the plot or even the larger narrative, so they can't simply be written off as nitpicks. And right off the bat, the perfect example comes to mind. This is one of the aforementioned arcs that has always been one of my favorites and one that I rewatched constantly throughout the years that unfortunately stopped holding up when I started looking at it critically for this video. What I'm referring to is the four-part season four arc where Obi-Wan goes undercover as a bounty hunter in order to find out everything he can regarding a plot to kidnap the Chancellor. To do this, he fakes his own death and disguises himself as the person who quote-unquote killed him, getting himself arrested so that he can get in good with the guy who came up with the kidnapping plot, this lovely gentleman named Moralo Evol. Gee, I wonder if he's a good guy or not. I've shown this arc to a lot of people since starting this project because I mean it when I say that this is one of my favorites, and I really wanted someone to convince me my criticisms were wrong and that it was actually better than I was giving it credit for. However, they all came out of it with the exact same criticisms and even a few more than I hadn't even really considered. It's a fundamentally broken arc, and at some point in part two, I'm gonna come back to break it down more thoroughly, but for the time being, all I want to do is look at what it represents for Obi-Wan's character, as well as explain what I mean exactly when I say it's an example of Obi-Wan being really, really stupid. Thankfully, we can kind of kill two birds with one stone here, because the reason I think this arc is beyond repair comes down to the broken premise, which is unfortunately contingent on the Jedi Council's stupid decision-making, which, as we find out later, was specifically Obi-Wan's own stupidity at work. So, like I said, Morala Weval has been taken into Republic custody, and somehow it's known that he has connections to Count Dooku and has concocted a plan to kidnap Chancellor Palpatine. So what are the Jedi I decide to do about it. Well, like I already said, Obi-Wan's plan is to have the Jedi hire a sniper to assassinate him, fake his own death, and then change his appearance so that he can effectively impersonate the assassin and get in good with Ival. They don't inform Anakin or Ahsoka of the plan, convincing both of them that Obi-Wan's actually dead. And more importantly, they hire Reiko Hardeen not to fake the assassination, but to actually earnestly attempt to kill Obi-Wan. Can, uh, can anyone else think of anything wrong with this plan? Cool. I I have several notes. Let's put aside the fact that this arc introduces several pieces of technology that would be absolutely world-changing, because like I said, we're gonna get into all that later. But yes, it's worth noting that just in the setup of this arc, we've introduced a vital suppressing device used by Obi-Wan to temporarily render himself dead to the world, as well as face and voice-changing technology that effectively allows people to shapeshift and impersonate anyone they desire should they have the right resources. Ugh, my brain already hurts. Any Anyway, uh, Obi-Wan, why in God's name would you hire an assassin to actually try to kill you? Are you fucking brain dead? You realize you need to be alive in order to complete this mission, right? All he had by way of protection was a metal plate over his chest, which just so happened to be where Hardeen decided to aim. Had he gone for the head, the whole plan would have gone to shit, and now we're down a Jedi Council member and we've accomplished nothing. Great idea. It's not like Hardeen had to be in on the full scope of the plan. If the Jedi had simply told him to stage the assassination and then go into some sort of witness protection while Obi-Wan sits in for him, then the risk that Kenobi will actually die becomes substantially lower. Even if you want to argue that it's too risky to loop Hardeen in because he might refuse the job, and then go blabbing to everyone else that the Jedi are trying to fake Obi-Wan's death for some reason, there are plenty of bounty hunters out there that you could hire who you know you can trust. Where's Imbo? What's he doing right now? He's actually in this arc, but he wasn't the one hired for this job. I mean, hell, you could have even had another Jedi impersonate a known bounty hunter by using the shape-shifting tech established in this episode. Then you wouldn't have to trust anyone outside your own ranks. But no, they hire a galaxy-class assassin to try to kill Obi-Wan, and then they get extremely lucky that he aims for the one tiny area where a blaster shot wouldn't be fatal. They're also pretty lucky that Obi-Wan survived this fall. Jedi or no, he wasn't doing jack shit to protect himself, and he hit a lot of things on his way down. And just as an aside, I find it a bit interesting that the bounty hunter they specifically decided to go with was Rako Hardeen, also known as the Marksman of Concord Dawn. Rako Hardeen. The Marksman of Concord Dawn. Concord Dawn is under Mandalorian jurisdiction, which means that technically, there'd probably be some kind of extradition treaty for Mandalorian citizens that are taken into Republic custody, and I think Satine would have a very personal reason to want the man who killed the one she loves brought to Mandalore and placed on trial. She's even present at Obi-Wan's funeral, so I think the Jedi are a bit lucky she didn't decide to extradite Hardeen. Of all the bounty hunters you could have gone for, this was potentially the worst possible candidate. But anyway, that's not even the 
worst part of this plan. Like I just said, both Anakin and Ahsoka were not informed of the plan ahead of time, and so they actually thought Obi-Wan was dead. They took him all the way back to the temple and buried a fake corpse. So the question is why? And this is the explanation Obi-Wan gives us. Keeping Anakin on the outside was critical. It was his reaction that sold the sniper. I'm sure of it. Okay, so let me get this straight. You kept your own Padawan and best friend in the dark about the fact that you're faking your own death, forcing this emotionally unstable man who you know has deep attachment issues, which is why you chose to give him a Padawan in the first place, to process and grieve the loss of his mentor. Also, his reaction would convince the sniper that he'd succeeded. Even though you didn't even need the sniper to really think he was trying to kill you for your plan to work. I really can't fucking stress this enough, guys. Not only does keeping the assassin out of the loop hurt your plan and gain you nothing more than what you'd have if he was in on it, but Obi-Wan himself decided that the best way to make sure the sniper was convinced was to have Anakin fucking Skywalker believe he was really dead. What, what the, the fuck? fuck? After Obi-Wan's funeral, he and Windu go to meet with Hardeen for his payment, which is where they do the swap and take Hardeen into custody, while Yoda alerts Anakin to his location so that he and Ahsoka can go arrest him. And like, it's bad enough that they didn't loop them in on the plan for reasons that don't make any sense, but why send Anakin to go arrest the person who he thinks killed Obi-Wan? That sounds like a disaster just waiting to happen. Hell, Anakin roughs him up pretty good, and it's only to honor Obi-Wan that he decides not to kill him. If it was up to me, I would kill you right here! But lucky for you. The man you murdered would rather see you rot in jail. But if you'd just sent any other Jedi to go arrest him, then this wouldn't have been an issue. Then again, it wouldn't have been an issue in the first place if they just told Anakin the truth. And actually, wait a minute. Why do the Jedi still keep him in the dark after this? His reaction sold the sniper, and now Obi-Wan's been promptly arrested, so there's no reason not to tell him now. It's worth bringing up, because in the next episode, Anakin almost completely derails the entire plan by going after Obi-Wan against the Council's orders, nearly managing to capture him. Now, you might argue that Windu figured Anakin was on a need-to-know basis and should simply obey his orders, but that would have been a pretty naive assumption to make about Anakin, and if that's the explanation we're going Going with, then I refuse to accept it. This guy has never been known to follow orders if he doesn't agree with them, and this mission is way too important for you to be taking a principled stance here. When talking about these episodes, you can't help but take a step back to look at the meta. What is this arc trying to accomplish? Well, points for effort because they're actually trying to break the mold and develop two characters simultaneously. Unfortunately, it just doesn't do that great of a job of it, and the foundation on which this development is built is this god-awful premise. But obviously the goal of this arc is to sow the first seeds of serious resentment and distrust toward the Jedi within Anakin, something which, as I already said, should have definitely started earlier on than Season 4, but alas. As well as forcing Obi-Wan into a position where he might have to throw aside his morals in order to accomplish his goal for what he sees as the greater good. I think these are both really interesting ideas, but I already went over why Anakin's arc is built on a mountain of sand, and with Obi-Wan, the issue is a little more complicated. If you think about it, the whole ends justify the means dilemma that Obi-Wan is forced to confront in this story is emblematic of the Jedi as a whole, and that's something they definitely could have played off of a little more. But it's also perfectly representative of Obi-Wan as an actual character in a sense. Think back to that argument between him and a Ahsoka from Siege of Mandalore that we talked about earlier. Like I already went over, the context didn't really fit the ideas Ahsoka was trying to get across, but the concept was certainly there. The Jedi, as specifically represented in that case by Obi-Wan, are so firmly bound by the red tape of the bureaucrats that they've become more focused on winning a war that they should never have even been a part of to begin with, rather than actually protecting the people they're sworn to defend. What could have been really interesting in this arc would have been for Obi-Wan to actually have to commit to that, have him take a step over that line in order to succeed in his mission. Or if you're not going to have him do that because you think that'd be too dark for his character, then I would at least like to see more impactful consequences for his refusal. In the scene where he refuses to kill Ival, even at Dooku's insistence, maybe this costs him a chance to be part of the kidnapping plot, making everything he went through throughout this entire story feel like it was for nothing, and forcing him to figure out some other way that he can listen in and help the Jedi. How about the scene where he's escaping the prison and can't bring himself to kill a clone, which allows said clone to raise the alarm before him being killed anyway by Bane. There aren't really any consequences to his hesitancy here, the prisoners are still able to get away without much issue. And yeah, Bane punches him in the face and makes it pretty clear that he doesn't trust him, but he already didn't trust him, so like, 
nothing's really changed. You've presented me with a moral quandary and didn't even bother following through on what it would mean for the story or for Obi-Wan's character. The only time in this arc Obi-Wan comes close to questioning what any of this means or if the Jedi have gone too far in certain aspects are when Anakin confronts him for not telling him about the plan. How many other lies have I been told by the Council? But that has nothing to do with these moments and we've already gone over why not telling Anakin was stupid. You can't really sell me on an ends justify the means narrative when the means don't serve the ends and are in fact detrimental to them. There are other examples of Obi-Wan's stupidity, but like I said, he's pretty much the least damaged of the main characters, so I'll just rapid fire a few more quick examples and then we can close this out. There's the example we already went over in the Onderon arc where Obi-Wan seems to have entirely forgotten the point of that story's premise, and then there was this one thing he did in the Ahsoka Youngling arc in Season 5 that I had totally forgotten about until this most recent rewatch. I would actually say this arc is over overall pretty solid. It held up a lot better than I was expecting, but there was a subplot during one of the episodes where the younglings contacted Obi-Wan because they were stranded in space after their ship was raided by the Onaka gang and Ahsoka was kidnapped. Obi-Wan tells them to hang tight and he's gonna send Commander Cody to go pick them up, but before he can do that, a Separatist fleet led by General Grievous surprise attacks them and takes over their ship. This is all in order to facilitate Obi-Wan's incapability of helping the younglings so that they have to go rescue Ahsoka themselves and that's all totally fine. If anything, it's really cool to see Grievous overrun Kenobi's flagship with little to no difficulty because, as we're gonna get into in the next video, there are very few moments on this show where Grievous is shown to actually be a skilled or competent character. But my issue here is that before departing the ship on escape pods, Obi-Wan rigged it to self-destruct on a timer, but then he left General Grievous a message telling him that the ship was gonna explode, and that's what allowed Grievous to escape just in the nick of time. Really not sure why Obi-Wan would do that. You could have killed Grievous right there and dealt a major blow to the droid army, but unfortunately, Grievous was in Revenge of the Sith, so we can't have him die here. This was a small moment in an otherwise solid arc, like I said, but it really did stick out like a sore thumb. And due to the severity of the consequences of this one stupid decision, I don't want to hear a single one of you call that a nitpick, because come on. Now, there's one other example that I can point to, but this one isn't a small thing, and it's actually something that's getting its own spotlight when we return for part two, so I'll shelve it for now. The subject in question is that the Jedi, and by extension Obi-Wan, are absolute fools for having not figured out that the clones were created by the Sith in order to destroy them, so stay tuned for that. But otherwise, yeah, that's all I'm gonna say about Obi-Wan. Like I said, he's the most consistent to his film counterpart, with fairly minimal damage compared to the rest, so overall not bad. And with that, this video is starting to get a bit lengthy, so I'm gonna go ahead and call it here. When we return, I'm gonna talk about the actual namesake of the Clone Wars, that being the clones, and we're gonna discuss some of the villains, so I finally get to talk about a character who I think is handled so egregiously, so downright horrifically, that it's one of the main reasons I decided to make a video on this show to begin with. I'm treating it like it's a mystery, but I think it's pretty obvious I'm talking about Dooku. All of that and so much more in part two. Before you guys head off, you know I gotta do a few plugs. Nothing too fancy, I'd just like to subtly remind you all that I'm a grifter and just want money. So if you wouldn't mind clicking the link to my Patreon and giving me all your life savings, I sure would appreciate it. Or if you want, just give me what you can to support me. That's fine too. Hell, you don't even have to give me anything at all, I'm not your mother. No, but seriously, it would help me out a great deal, and if you guys like what you've seen here, your patronage would mean the absolute world to me. Also, Merry Christmas, you filthy animals! I've been working on this video all fucking year, and I'm fi I finally have something put out there. I, like, literally since January 5th, you can, I can, you can look on my Twitter. That's when I started my rewatch, and I've, I've been working on this all fucking year, and now I've, I've got part one out, so that's, Wonderful! <laughs> By the way, I have a Discord server and you should all totally join it. It's what all the cool kids are doing. We talk about movies and stuff, and I figure that's probably your cup of tea if you're watching this video. So, once again, link is in the description. I hope to see you there. But otherwise, that's all for today, and I'll see you in hell!